The select committee will come to order. At this, the beginning of Ramadan, as Muslims around the world commemorate Prophet Muhammad receiving the first revelations of the Quran, we are here to face a horrifying truth. The Uyghurs, many of whom practice the Muslim faith, are being erased. Genocide is occurring, this time at the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. We are privileged to have with us many members of the Uyghur community. We are deeply grateful for your bravery, and we know that it has come at a great cost. As we prepare to hear firsthand testimony from the CCP's concentration camps, I would like to turn to Alicia Wiesel, whose father, Auschwitz survival, survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel, singularly captured the horrors of the Holocaust in his book, Night. Without objection, the video will be added to the record and the clerk will play the video. Thank you, Chairman Gallagher, Ranking Member Krishnamurthy, and the whole select committee. Last year, I spoke to the United Nations on International Holocaust Remembrance Day. My speech highlighted the Uyghur cause. Some people were confused. Others sought to dissuade me. What, they asked, does the Holocaust have to do with the Uyghurs? The answer is, we may say never again, but genocide is, in fact, happening again, and it is happening on our watch. You are sitting in Washington, D.C., I am sitting in New York. Some are watching from Beijing. These places sometimes feel like the center of the universe, but they are not. There is a place right now where an entire people spend their days either experiencing or living in fear of imprisonment, forced sterilization, and torture. There is a place where the absence of a free press creates a blanket of darkness under which these crimes occur. There is a place from which a handful of eyewitnesses, such as Gulbahar Hatiwaji, have survived to tell their story as my father did with night. My father swore in his Nobel Prize speech never to be silent whenever and wherever human beings endure suffering and humiliation. Wherever men or women are persecuted because of their race, religion, or political views, that place must, at that moment, become the center of the universe. Xinjiang is the center of the universe. Dear members of the select committee, thank you for bringing us there with you. Tonight, we have two guests whose stories will take us to the center of the universe, to the place where the world's moral attention should be focused, to Xinjiang. These two women were both inside the concentration camps. They are firsthand witnesses to the systemic, unimaginable brutality. Witnesses to the attempted elimination of a people, a culture, a civilization. Witnesses to the largest extrajudicial mass internment of a religious minority since the Holocaust. Witnesses to erasure. That's why Elie Wiesel, who swore to fight those who would forget, he swore to fight those who would avert their gaze. Today, in fact, we had a high-profile hearing on the Hill where the CEO of a major company called TikTok was asked no less than four times whether what's happening in Xinjiang is a genocide, and he refused to answer. The least we can do on this committee is to make sure that in 50 years, when the Xinjiang genocide is remembered as one of the abominations of the 21st century, no corporate executive, no policymaker, no investor, no university president can look their grandchildren in the eye and claim they didn't know. I now recognize the ranking member, Raja Krishnamurthy, for his opening statement. Good evening and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Tonight we will hear the harrowing testimony of Uyghur and Muslim women who were jailed in mass internment camps by the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP. The pain and suffering these women endured is horrifying. The evidence presented here has not only been corroborated by the testimony of other survivors, but also by thousands of pages of leaked internal CCP documents, photographs, and even satellite imagery. The CCP's genocide against Uyghurs and other Muslim groups is real. Not only is it going on to this day, it is expanding. It is not too late to confront these atrocities so that the famous saying, never again, can actually become a reality. The CCP's genocide did not happen overnight. It was the result of decades of planning. 
This crackdown has been both methodical and monstrous. A CCP religious affairs official described what they're doing to the Uyghurs in this way. Quote, break their lineage, break their roots, break their connections, and break their origins. Completely shovel up the roots of, quote, two-faced people, dig them out, and vow to fight these two-faced people until the end. Today, we know that as many as two million Uyghurs and other Muslims have been jailed in mass concentration camps. They are subjected to political indoctrination indoctrination, torture, forced labor, and other human rights abuses. Countless people have been disappeared. Nearly half a million Uyghur children have been taken from their families, and tens of thousands of women have been forcibly sterilized. Even outside the camps, Chinese high-tech companies work closely with government officials to impose a pervasive and high-tech surveillance system that has been called an open-air prison. The tech ecosystem used to repress Uyghurs has global implications. The PRC's largest high-tech companies are exporting surveillance, facial recognition, and social tracking technologies to other countries from Iran to Syria to Burma, and thereby undermining democratic movements worldwide. In addition, the CCP has long viewed Xinjiang as a strategic gateway critical to the expansion of the Belt and Road Initiative. International companies were invited into Xinjiang and have based their supply chains on cheap sources of labor, which have turned out to be forced labor. As a result, the global economy has been contaminated by products made by forced labor, including about 20% of the world's cotton and half of the world's polysilicon used in solar panels. In 2021, Congress passed the bipartisan Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act that forces companies to move their supply chains to ensure they are not profiting from forced labor and genocide. More needs to be done, and this committee can help lead the way. Make no mistake, CCP leaders are absolutely listening to us closely this evening. They are intensely focused on world opinion, and they fear being held accountable by the international community for their, for their actions. This, this evening, let's make sure the CCP hears us loud and clear. Their genocide must end. Tonight is the second night of Ramadan. Thousands of my constituents, millions of our fellow Americans, and countless others are celebrating the holiday with families. In our country, they are free to practice their religion, and although I am not Muslim, I wish them Ramadan Mubarak. In the PRC, however, Xi Jinping has decided to continue the sinicization of Islam. Sinicization of Islam means that men are not allowed to wear beards and women cannot wear hijabs. In short, unlike here, freedom of religion in China means the freedom to practice religion as Chairman Xi sees fit. That is not freedom, that is tyranny. I close with the case of Dr. Gulshan Abbas, a Uyghur medical doctor who was forcibly disappeared in 2018. Gulshan was sentenced in 2020 to a 20-year prison term because her American sister, Rushan Abbas, criticized the CCP from here within America. I know this situation well because Rushan was my State of the Union guest. Gulshan has serious health conditions and has never been involved in political activism whatsoever. As with others, I say to the CCP, release Gulshan and the others now. I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member. If any other member wishes to submit a statement for the record, without objection, those statements will be added to the record. We are deeply privileged this evening to hear from two first-hand witnesses to the Uyghur genocide. We are honored to have with us tonight Ms. Gulbahar Haitawaje, an incredibly brave woman who spent two years in a Xinjiang camp. She's the author of How I Survived a Chinese Re-Education Camp, A Uyghur Women's Story. The first published account describing life inside the camps, Ms. Haitawaja lives in France with her family, and we are incredibly grateful that she traveled here to, tell, to share her story with us. We are also privileged to be joined by Ms. Kelvinor Saduk, a human rights activist and witness to the genocide in Xinjiang, 
Ms. Saduk worked as a Chinese language teacher for, a primary, for primary school students before she was assigned to work as a teacher in the re-education camp. After seeing and experiencing atrocities firsthand, Ms. Saduk has become an extraordinary advocate for all those languishing under the thumb of the CCP. She resides in the Netherlands, and we are grateful that she traveled to be with us here tonight. Welcome, and thank you for being with us here this evening. If you could please stand and raise your right hand, I will now swear you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief? So help you God. You may be seated. Let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. You may be seated. Thank you. Ms. Haitawaja, you may begin. Salam hanımla efendile men lagir şahiti gulbar bulime 2006 yıldın ta hazırgıçılık Fransiyat yaşap kevatime 2016 yıldın ahiri men Xıtay hükümetinin ki aldap çakırtışı bilen vatenge kaytip berip Xıtayının ki vatenimizdeki uyğurlar üçün aşkan tutup duruş merkezi ve ceza lagirlarda üç yıl yıkın tutum. Sağçılar desepten benim pasportumda tatip edip andın adam toplayıp cemiyet tartımını buzgan digen tökmetki kol koyuşku mecburladı. My name is Gulbar Hatwaji. Um, <clears throat> since 2006, I lived in France. At the end of 2016, I was lured back to China to do my um, pension retirement process. But after I went back to China, the first my passport was taken, and then I, they sent me to both detention camps as well as concentration camps for three years. Andın minun putumga kishanni silib kamirga kirib solibatdi. Bu yerdagi kamirdagi ayollarning ahvoli intayin ichinishlik, putun ayollarning putlari kishanlangan, ona tilimiz bo'lgan uyg'ur tilida so'zlashimiz cheklangan. The first they shackled my feet and then they detained. The women's condition in the detention centers are horrible. The all women are shackled and our language of Uyghur will prohibit to speak. Nöldün tüven 20 neçi gradusluk soğukta şamaldetimiz digen bana bilen saatlap talada turguzup koyup kıynaydı. Her kitim sorak açıqa vaxtı da kolumuzunu keyni çalap koyu silip, bişimizi karakaltı kigizip, tömür orunduqa put kolumuzunu mukumlaştırıp koyup durup sorak oludu. In order to, with the name of taking us out from the cell and the to see the fresh air, but in reality, they torture us on the 20 Celsius degrees, cold weather. Um, uh, and also, they interrogate us from time to time. Each time they interrogate us, they put black hood uh, to our head, and they shackle our feet, and they handcuff us. Then they, they took us to interrogation room, then let us sit in a tiger chair without moving condition and then they start to interrogate. Şikimen o yattın jili tötün jayının birinci günü biz barlıq ayarlarını karabat kız zanjirde yapıp koydu. Mən jigir mükün zanjirde yapıp tutudum. On 1st of April 2017, the all women detainees were chained onto the bed. I was chained to the bed for 20 days. Ceza lagırdın ki, hem yerde kamera var, bütün herkesimiz küzdülüp durdu. Bir yerde bizde yılda çıkıp gittim, zükamdan aldığın alımızda vaksin oldu. Vaksin uğrulgan dinken ayarlarının asasiyatın adetleri toktap gitti. There are cameras all over the camp, every place. Every move, our every move was monitored. And twice a year they said they would administer a vaccination. But in reality, after this vaccination, all women's period has stopped. 
Yerde ben okşamakan işki ceza lagırı tutdum, destep tutukan ceza lagırımda o yetti yaştan yetmiş yaş kişilik işki yüz elli kiyikin ayalabatı, bu ceza lagırı tekme cik adamda sığdıran mıgalık üçün işki mong on sekizinciyi, onun cayına on sekizinci günü bizni yengden silingan çok bir ceza lagırı yutkide, muşu ceza lagırı ketken meblağa karaplam xtaynın ki uygulanı sistemlik yoktuş üçün tuzgen planlarının ki kısmı müddet planemez. Uzun müddetlik plan hikayelerini bulabildim buldu. I spent two different types of concentration camps. The one was um, there were detainees from 17 years old to 70 years old people, and there were 250 person. The later they have moved me to a different camp, which is it happened on October 18, 2018. They took us to new camp, but the, the building that new camp. To me, it costed a huge. They invested a lot. From that new camp, I can imagine that the Chinese government took systematic abuse against the Uyghurs. It's not something that is short-term plan. It is for long-term plan. Bir de biz künüge 11 saatla sınıfta oturup, Hıttay'ın ki bizim kalımızın yüzyılgan tarih, kanun ve hansı ötüle derslerine uygunumuz, hep de bir kızın dağışı uygunumuz, hep de ahırda bunu da imtihan bir ettik. We spent 11 hours uh, in that camp to learn brainwashing uh, education. It's, it includes a history, law, and also we have to sing red songs. And each, at, at the end of each week, and we have to test that, about what we have learned. Bir de müşü yeni lagır kekendikin bizni işkimeğin 18. yılı 11. ayının 5. gününden başlayıp 4 adamla bir grup kıp durup bizde sot içip bizde kesim ilan kıldı. Mağın 7 yıllık hüküm ilan kıkan. In that new camp on uh, November 5th 2018 they uh, organized a group of four people together and then they start to bring us to trial. In that trial they have sentenced me for 7 years jail. Eğer bizden ki Uygur tılıdı sözleş, sözleşkenimizde bilip kalsa bir ayrım solaydıgan bir e, uyba şu uyga 24 saat, 48 saat hatta 72 saatla e, solap koyup e, tamak su bemetti, e, tömür uğrunduğa putkulumuzu mukumlaştırıp koyup ta ki biz e, mən hata kıptıma, mən işkinci Uygurcu sözü meyme digenge kadar solap koyuttu. If they find out that we spoke in Uygur language, they would lock us in a separate room. They would leave us for 24 hours to until 72 two hours and um, lock us into a tiger chair and they keep us until we say that we never going to speak in Uyghur language. Xitay hükümeti qaytı tərbiyeləyimiz digən bana bilən heç qanda günay yox boğan ayallarını əkirib şüşəyə solab atdı. Bu ayallarının ki ən çox günayı bolsa yağlıq atqan, namaz oxuyub qoyğan, Yakubumuz öydə Quran kitabını saxlayğan, çətdə balları oxuyub atqan, çətdə səyahət qıçıqqan Adamla bulanın hiç kaysı kayıt terbiyeleniş ihtiyacı yok bulan doktor hanıki doktorla mektepteki muallimla bank kadınları yakıt ticaretçiler şundakla ilgili pensiyeye çıkan mukam kırma babuğan iş hizmetçiler. Um, with the excuse of so-called re-education, the Chinese government actually detained most of the innocent people. The reason for detention was simply some people just wore a headscarf or kept the Quran in the house, or they have traveled to foreign countries, or they have connection with the foreign countries. And the detained people include just the retired um, professionals and intellectuals. 2019 yılı 3. ayının 12. günü sakçılar beni bu ceza lagırıdan şarayet yakışarak boğan bir yerine uğurlaştı dedi. Bir yerde ben bir adamını 3 er sakçı bilen 8 ay yıl sakçı küzdü dedi. Bir yerde ki benim vazifem yakışı yiyiş, yakışı uklaş, televizör görüş. Çünkü ben uğurluklar 50 kilo oğum yetmeyi dağın bulup kalan. Eğer Hıhtay hükümeti beni şundak akvalası da Fransa'ya yolu sayıp koysa, Hıhtaylanın ki Şarkı Türkistan da ceza lagırlı yok digen ilgi nimelerge uygun kemetti hem özlerinin ki şu anda irki kırgınlık ipir vatkalık aşkarını falatti. March 13, 2019, they have moved me to a little bit better conditioned detention facility. But at that facility, all I have to do was eat and the rest. 
But that detention, I stayed under supervision or monitoring of three male guard and eight female policemen. And they had to feed me well because I was lost so much weight that my weight was less than 50 kilograms. Um, in order to, that purpose was because after I go back to France and they have to make sure that they want to prove that the, the denial of that I was detained in the concentration camps and there is genocide happening in East Turkestan. For that purpose, they feed me before they send me to France. Men Shkimong on Tokuzin Jili, second general Jigrim Brinjukini, Francia, Ukumitaniki, diplomatic Arlishi, Kazumniki, Kushkrishiblan, Khtaniki, Jazala Gurdon Kutlup, a Francia Kawaldem, Shege Kilishton Brun, Sachila, Sachibashla Mendin, Shu Jaza Lagarlota, Bishindun Utkan, Kuzumla Kugalani, Chetelgich Kandikan, Hishkana Adam Gatun Maslamni, Eger Oscar Lassam, Shuvetan the Kapaldan Urt Kalurunga, Hatri Hitalan, Deptur Mantaki Saran. August 21st, 2019, I came to France with the help of my daughter's campaign and the, the French government's diplomatic involvement with the Chinese government. Before I came to France, the police uh, head, the police boss told me that whatever I have witnessed in the concentration camp, I should not talk about it. If I do, they said they will retaliate against my family members back home and they will the consequence will be, my relatives will pay for the consequence. Ben Fransa'ya çıkan dedi ki, üzerimde bir şeyden ötke vakalarını kitap alıp izlip çıktım. Kitap çıkımın, jigerin birinci ile birinci ayının 13. günü neşirden çıktı. Kitap neşirden çıkan dedi ki, Kıhtay hükümeti beni terörce edip ilan kıldı. Şu günden başlayıp, benim vatandaki barlık uluk tıkalarım bilen boğan alakam üzüldü. Hazır gıçılık, ulağının ulağabilen işkandak alakam yok. After I came to France, later I wrote my experience and my book was published January 13, 2021. After my book published, Chinese government accused me, said that I am a terrorist. Since then, I lost contact with my family. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your story. Uh, Ms. Saduk, you're now recognized for your opening statement. Assalamu alaikum, hürmetli hanımla efendiler. Ben ceza lagir şahidi kalbimdur sızıktın, silahge salamla bulsun. Ben şikimim o yetinceli üçüncü aydın, tokuzuncu aygıca, vettimiz Şerk Türkistan Ürümç şehri, Sayvağ rayını Tanfanga kurulgan, manu bu erlek kampısı da altı ay, Hıhtay tıl dersi uçuşke mecburlandım. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my name is Kalbimdur Sıdık. I am a concentration camp witness. Um, I, on March 9th, 2017, I was sent to the um, concentration camp, which is the, the picture shown in Saivar district, Urumqi, for six months. Bu tört qəvətlik binanın tamdan üstülür bütünlə elektronik toksimlar olan qatıq oru qorşalğan, işçi və sırtıda, koridorlarda, ərbi, saxçıla, qorallı qalda, xudazı cəngi çıxılığan da qalda qoqdab durdu. This is a four-floor building. The walls are covered with razor wire, and around the building and inside the building, there are military, the policemen with the rifles. It looks like kind of war zone. Tutkun erlani ki yüzde 90 percenti 18 yaştan 40 yaş kiche, fakat 10 percenti 40 yaştan yukarı ve 70 yaş kılaydı. The detained male uh, prisoners, the 90% of, of them are 17 years old to uh, 40 years old male, but 10% is from 40 years old until 70 years old. Tutkun erler kamerlada 30'un 40'ca kısılışıp durdu ve kuruk sımotun usu diyatı du. In one cell there are 30 to 40 detains, uh, 40 prisoners detained. And also those detains are slips on the cement floor. Ula her gün lige tamakaga Britanya'nın xtay momisi olan kuruk şogrusu içido. Hatta altay jeryanda bırakatın muçukrib jin jinu pakını yok. Ula tuvaletle çıkış için mu vakit bekle piyeliyen. For each meal they eat one Chinese bun and water. 
And even going for toilet, it's monitored, and they had to spend designated time. And also, um, you know, within six months, none of them had any shower. Tutkun erle, tutkulları bana muşundak, zencirlengen ve kişilengen alda, kamırladı ki, tam bilen, işkindeki tutkusu zencirlengen işkindin, 30 gras içilgen, ömülep çıkıdı sınıplağa, sınıptın ömülep kamırı kaytudu. Like this, the detainees chained and also shackled. The, the cell doors is 30 percent, 30 degrees kind of open, so they are unable to stand and walk out and into the cell. So they had to crawl out from the cell, and then they go to classrooms for re-education. Meyli ders vaklar olsun, çiçlik aramiliş vaklar olsun. Bu tutkun erlerinden aldık bir silgan numarla arkalık, çakırıp etkilip, sorakladı ve sorak cerrianda her kıl kıyın kısakla öparıldı. Bu sorak kılındıkan cay, sınıp denki, yine deki yarası boğaşka, ula çakırıp çiketken denki ilham, yerim saat denki, ulanın içinişlik avazları bütün binanın zızlık salıdı. Whether the detainees are in the classroom or outside, they will call it by the number and then taken for interrogations. The inter interrogation rooms are located just next to the classes, not too far. So after 30 minutes that the, the prisoners were taken, and then you will hear horrible screaming sound from torture, because they are tortured while interrogating. <laughs> Yani elektronluk kaltek, elektronluk doppa, elektronluk pele ve elektronluk tümür orunduk. Yani bu yolvas orunda patladı. There are four types of torturing methods. One is electric button, electric helmet, electric glove and a tiger chair. Sonra çünkü bu tutkula hep de hep de ki aylap dersle katılmayıdı. After the interrogation, after the torture, those uh, prisoners are unable to come to class for weeks or months. Kim oyatta tokuzunca eden ombrunca gece, meyilşü vatanımızda ürümçileri, sayvak rayını togun kurulgan, manu bu alt kavetlik kız ayalla kampsak yut geldim. Um, from September till November 2017. I was moved to this sixth floor building, which kept female prisoners. Uh, it located in Tugong, Urumqi. Bu altı kavetlik balkonsuz bina olup, viyage on mangı yakın kız ayalla solangan. There is no balcony of these buildings. Um, there are over 10,000 female prisoners were detained. Tutkun kız ayallanan çayları bütünle çürütülgen. Uçtuğa külür ağın mahpus kıyımı kıyıgen, onun üstüde absinler ağına cilid ki var, cilid ki de üstüde nomur besilgan. The old female prisoners, the hair was shaved and they were wearing grey uniform and the top of them there is yellow vest and on that vest there is a numbers, those prisoners are only called by numbers. Tutkun kız ayalla her düşen bir günde namayalım doğru içi de olağa, anadikin hukulurdu ve uladın kanaldı. Each Monday, the prisoners, the female prisoners, will administer a unknown medicine and the taken blood from them. Tutkun kız ayalana yüzde 90 percent yani oksajlam, 18 yaştan 40 yaş kucu bulup, ula doğru iç cerrahına da kız ayalana putle adetler toktuvetliyken, hatta bal imitvat kalanı sütürüm toktab ketken. The 90 percent of the female prisoners are from 18 years old to 40 years old. After they take the, those medicines, the period will stop. Even some uh, women who were breastfeeding the babies, the breast milk will stop after, the, after taking that medicine. Tehimu deşet boğunu, bu kız ayalı sorak ceryanda, Kıhtay sakçılarının sorak kılıç arkalık, bulanı baskonçılık uçur aptırdı, nöbet kılıç baskonçılık kılıç, hatta ki kuludik elektronluk kaltekle bile, şu kız ayalarının cinsi mekat yollarına kıynaş yapardı, tıkış arkalık. The, the horrible thing is, when those female prisoners were taken for interrogation, they faced gang rape by the guards. And the worst thing is they, the guards or police use electric button to insert their private parts to rape, um, rape and to torture them. 
Ben şu yerde ki 18 yıl mı aşka tabi bir kızın acısıdır şahit oldum. Yani bu kız özlem adı doktuma kanser ab şikayet yakın. Şikayet bir zembil de etmangın öz gözüm dikiyorken. And I have witnessed a 18 to 20 year old girl's death. That girl's the period didn't stop for two months because of bleeding she passed away. I have witnessed that death of the girl. Kampılağır işi olsun ve sırtı olsun, sırtı dikilen mi üstü uçuk türmeler yaşaydı. Ulan mı özünün ki mesul olan sakçıları ve ağırlık komitik kadrlarının bana bu şunda kutturuşları asasen doktor kallağı verip yüzük saldırıldı ve tuğması operasyası kılındı. The outside to camp is not different from as well. It's, it is like just an open prison. The outside the camp, the people will face the exactly same monitoring and sterilization. Like for example, this is the policies that issued by the government. By these policies, there's a woman's need, many women need to forcibly insert IUDs and sterilized. Şu yerde ki Uygur kız ayarları okşaj, ürün bir şehir, tensar rayını çağlayan ki caylaşkan, bana bu doktor hanımda mecburi tutmaz operasyası kalındı. Just like many other women in my homeland, on, at the end of May 2019, 19, I was sterilized in Changlayan Hospital in Tianshan District in Urumqi. Bunun da sırt, yani Hıhtay'la aşkımın 17. yılı yolu koyan, atalmış, koşma Hıhtay Ertuğanlarını, şu yerdik Uyghur ayarlarına uygun mecbur ekreşi arkalık, özünün üyü de, yani herkli şekilde, depsençilik ve zorabalık uçurup durdu. And also, China initiated another policy of becoming relatives with Chinese officials. And through that policy, the many Uyghur women face abuse, rape and humiliation on the Chinese officials in, at their own houses. Minin ailem gibi olmuş, şimdi Hıhtay Koşmak Ertuğan oralaştırılan bulup, bunu da Hıhtay hükümeti aşılığa beşli bölüm oluş prinsipini çürpeyken. Um, even one of the Chinese officials were allocated to stay at my house. And there are five um, policy, saying that the five together policy. Yani bu beşli bölüm oluş dikimiz, bilde tamak itiş, bilde tamak yiyiş, Bille uygun iş kılış, bille seyli kılış ve bille yetiş. That five together is eat together, cook together, learn together, sleep together and the sightseeing together. Bu Hıhtay Ertuğan, Tukan her ayda bir hep de öğüdü turdu ve tamak yetiş yer yanında, tamak yiş yer yanlarda sizin kollarınızın, dümbülerinizin sılaş arkalık. Sen bak güzelken sen tamakın bak okşaptı, bana bizim kolumuzda beşli bile buluşma dep. Şu üzümüzden üyüde, bana bu şundak depsenciklerden hep vardı. That the male, the Chinese official, communist official, while staying in the house, for example, at my house, they had, they supposed to stay one week initially. And while staying, you know, when I, when I am cooking in the kitchen or doing something, that Chinese official would come just to relentlessly touch my all over the body, And would say, and by showing the paper saying that, look, in that policy saying that we can cook together, do things together, and then, you know, with the excuse or praising me, how am I cooking, everything, and they try to touch me and abuse me, kind of humiliate me. Şimdi ben 18 yıldan başlayıp, yani vatandaşımız Şerif Türkistan'da, manumuşun da nurgun lakan, kul zavutları şekillendi. Bunun da yani mecburi emgek, şu yerde ki kız ayalla, kampı lagırlığa dikile, bu yerde mecburi kul işçi o pişleydi. From 2018, there appeared many slave factories. Um, there are many detainees, the people who detain in the concentration camps forced to work in those slave factories. Ben şükümü 19. yılı, 10. ayda, Gollandiya garajdan olan kızımdın ki zor tırışçalığı, ve özlem Özbek milleti boğaşka, Gollandiya'ya geçip kilerledim. Ama yolduşum Uyghur boğalık için, Hıhtay sakçıları onun çıkışını katli çekledi. On October 2019, with the help of my Netherland citizen daughter, I was able to escape to Netherland. And because I'm Uzbek and I was able. However, because my husband, he is a Uyghur. 
because of simply he's a Uyghur, he's unable to come to Netherlands with me. Guardian, BBC, Sayin Lachiket Kandikin, Hutai Saksilere, Mina Vatanakaran Tukalere, where Yoldishim Arkalak, Vijat Ichi Mantakil From January 2020, I start to speak out about the genocide that happening in my homeland. And my witness testimonies published in Guardian, BBC, and the CNN. After these publications, Chinese government used my husband and relatives WeChat and they contacted me. Mana bu shikimang jigerim birinchili, shikinjayning 18-chi kuni etgan saat 9 yerimda Urimshar Tensar rayoni Baqulang saqchxansidagi Livenjang menga yo'l dushim va odamning vichati orqali ekra aytib, meni o'z uchun xizmat qilishga majburladi, men qo'shilmagandikin, menga ta'kid qildi. This is a policeman from Baqulang in Urumchi. He uh, used my husband and my sister's uh, video chat, WeChat video, and rang me on February 18, 2021. And he forced me to work for Chinese government, and I refused. Video is the Arkalak, Minokat Kangual from the Hamini Yolgang Chade, Rabunoka Triste, Unodin Kiana, Vichat Ekraj Arkalak, Yolushumne Arkal Egil Egil August Lahana Tavlan Tulap, Minna Majbur Ajrasturvati, where I am the very uncle. Just one day before that, the London Uyghur Tribunal happened, which is June 4th, 2021. Again, the Chinese police used my husband's WeChat and they reached out to me. And they used very abusive languages against me. And also, at the end, they forced me to divorce from my husband. And they tried to tell that whatever I say and all my testimonies are false. And with that, they destroyed my family. Shunonda etvaran ta azr qadar men vatan qagan tuqallarimni va shu yo'lishimni tirikmi, hayotmi, tirikchi xabarim yo'q, Allah qan putunlar uzilgan. Ammanlar rahmat. Since then I lost my contact. I lost contact with my family members including my husband. I'm not sure whether my husband is still alive or not. Thank you. I've uh, I've been here over 6 years now, not as long as some, but I've I've never heard such powerful uh, personal testimony. So thank you for uh, your bravery in speaking and standing up to the Chinese Communist Party and thank you for entrusting us with your stories. Uh, it's an honor. Um, without objection, I would like to now invite Representative Steele to engage in a colloquy with one of our witnesses to further discuss their firsthand experiences of the CCP's genocide to be followed by a colloquy with Representative Carson. Representative Steele, you are now recognized for a five-minute colloquy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you very much, witnesses. You, you know, you guys are very much courageous coming out, and you are just not let us know, but you are letting American people know that what CCP does. So I'm just so grateful. Human rights abuses happening at the hands of CCP should horrify every one of us. We cannot allow what they are doing to fly under the radar. The CCP is committing genocide against Uyghurs and other ethnic and religious minorities like Muslims and Christians. We cannot be silent. The CCP is the greatest threat to democracy. Today, that means exposing the CCP for who they are and ensuring the world hears your stories. Thank you for coming out. And you know, my own family fled from North Korea from communism. I heard about it, and I had two ladies actually came from Uyghur. They had the, the uh, labor camp experiences, and they talked about it before they go in. When, before they go to the prison, they actually scan your organs. So when you have uh, healthy organs, the CCP is harvesting those organs, and they're selling it. So they are doing organ harvesting. But you know what? When I read your stories, it's just 
It's horrifying. It's much worse than what I heard. So I just want to ask you, Ms. Sudak, that you had experiences in those labor camp. Could you tell us a little more about that, how the CCP has been treating Uyghur children in the camp? And I think you saw those people there. Şu yada kurulan iki çok kuzağıtıga, ben özem bağan. Bunun birinci kuzağıtı, Ürümşehir Tensar Rayonu, Hunyalı diye bir caylaşkan. Çünkü bu yada benim hizmette yol düşüm, işte yada hizmet kurdu çok bir şirket bu. Müşiyege, şimdi ben 18 yıl, Kaşka Ahtuden, Brüyüz Ontöt. Uyghur yaş kızcık diyor ki hep Personally myself, I have been to two slave factory. Those factories were located in Tianshan, Tianshan, Hongyanlu, Urumqi, and it's kind of big company. And in 2018, this company, this factory, brought many young Uyghurs from Ahto Kashkar. Çünkü yolcumdan ki, hatta istaz yakışmamalı kuşun, aşağıda mangan telefon edip, şu yerde ki selke zavut başlıklar veren, aşu kiyen kol işçilerden, toktam tuzmek için kabul onlarca türlük, şu toktamdan tercümesi mangan kiyen hatta işe, hem Uyghurce, çünkü nayet inek isimde kagan. I remember that incident very clearly because since my husband's Chinese is not good, he doesn't have good Chinese skills, so he needed to uh, talk to the, um, the workers and they had to make a contract between the factory and the workers. So I personally involved in making that contract. That contract was both in Chinese and Uyghur, so that's why I know. Badavengi Jailashkan, Sanat Rayuni, Buyaga, Shuzdin, Beshuz Gitche, Kaz Jigitla Shadishlado. And another slave factory was uh, located in Badavan. There are from 300 to 500 young uh, girls and boys work there. Another kid man, Shuvat in the Sharkurkstan Urim Sharda, Bashan was made up there, Jigrim Sekzil, Title Das Oxbodo. Bu kampı lagırla kurulgan dinkin, şu suyumluk narsıda okuçularımdan intayın deştige ta hazır kadar unutuyamadım. Um, I worked as a teacher for a elementary school in Urumqi for 28 years. Until today, I, I am unable to forget the young innocent students that I have. Çünkü 2016 yılı yıl ahırdan başlayıp şu okuyucularımızdan dadısı, apısı veya ki bütün tukalı tutup ekilgen, ekilgen bu başka, bula daim bizden sual zor etti. Muallem, ne müşter mi ne apam tutup ekildi ya ki dadam ne ya ki tağam ne? Dep müşter sualdan sor etti. Bu sualdan ben cevap veriş ki aciz idim. From the end of 2016, the, the children, the students in my classroom, they start to ask, Teacher, why my parents are taken? Why my uncle are taken? Because there are many parents who are taken, separated from the children. And I was unable to answer that question because it's very painful. Lekin şunda kosum özemde zorgu berip, pisip ulağı teselli beretti. Bala hükümet ulağını dövlet tele yüklişke ek etti. Sen hatırcan bul çokum kaytip gidiyordu da. Yani ne çıkındı ki ulağı yan davamlık mendin sonra etti. Malum ne müşün bizdeki mektep sorup okumaydı ulağı da. Demek ta hazır kadar minon jürgümde azaplaydığını şu okucumdan cevapsız kalan şu sualları. I had to explain them differently. I would tell them that, um, you, know, you know what, your parents had to learn national language. That's why they were taken. But the kids were unable, they didn't satisfy with that. They said, if they had to learn the language, why would they not learn the language, the school that we are in right now? Um, until today, I feel the extreme pain that I wasn't able to uh, give them the satisfactory answer. 
Bu yerde yani şu okuluşlarının ki balla kampsi, yasli kampıları tesislendi. Onda atalmış yataklık mekteb diye bilen emniyet temsi kampıla. Um, since then there is um, children's camp start to appear like it's so called, it, it's the name called it's kindergarten or boarding school but in the reality it was a camps for the children thank you so much mr chairman i think i'm going to just submit a few more questions uh, in writing so because my time is up so i yield back thank you very much mr carson you're now recognized for a five minute colloquy Thank you so very much, uh, Chairman, and thank you, Ranking Member Krishnamurthy. Um, Ramadan Mubarak, I extend uh, a warm welcome to the witnesses. Um, I thank you both, and I thank you all for working together uh, to make this happen. Um, first, our committee recognizes the very unique and irreplaceable uh, Uyghur people and the right to practice your faith and your faith, uh, to celebrate your culture and your language, and to pass it down to your children. Your testimony uh, is so very powerful, and we thank you for your bravery uh, in coming here today telling your stories. Uh, Ms. Haitawaji, uh, thank you again, and, and thank you, Ms. Sedik. Um, you talk about the indoctrination uh, that you've endured, both of you. Uh, we know the CCP's attempt to marginalize and systematically erase people's cultures and, and, and beliefs is a form of oppression. Can you elaborate on how uh, this made you feel as a Uyghur woman and its impact on the community and its implications going forward and what the global community has to do to bring a change? Ben cezalı agırda turvat kavaktımda bizge künüge 11 saatle kanun, tarık, hıhtaytılı dersini ütetti. Onun kendin ütülgen derslerinin hemini biz çokum yatlışımız gerekti. Hep de akırda imtihan bir ettik. While I was in the camp, uh, there are 11 hours lesson, brainwashing les lesson on daily basis. The lessons include Chinese law, history, and the Chinese language. And after, and also we had to memorize everything. And also we have to test after learning all of them. Biz bütünlerim şu partiye hükümetini küylediğin kızıl nakşılarını hep dedi bir nakşı ürünümüz bunu odun hep de akırı imtihan birimiz. And also we have to learn songs that praising Chinese Communist Party and the government. And again, we have to test at the end of the week. Andan biz kündülük hatiri yazışkın mecburlandık. Biz şu lagırı verip bir şey kütüydün ki Bu kündülük hatiri gəp biz özümüzdün ki jürek sözlerimiz yazamayımız. Pekat, bu şu partiye hükümetinin bizini türmülek apamay şu aşu, şu mektepte uqtuş pürstini bəgəlikliğe rəhmet etimiz. Pekatla partiye hükümetinin ki yakşılıkını and also we have to write daily record, daily uh, description or expression about our thoughts. And that thoughts shouldn't be gen genuine. And that should be just including praising the government and authority that, that, that thank them that we were not taken to prison. Rather, we were uh, sent to the re-education to learn, we have to be grateful for that we not sent to prison. Her günü sınıf kırıga vaktimizde tamak yiyen yiyen yiştim burun partiye uluk vatanımızı rahmet, Jongo Komünistik Partisi rahmet, 
Şijinpiyanga rahmet dedik. Dersten çıkanda tamak dinkiyin bu üçüge tılak dedik. Before eating, we have to praise or say that we we are grateful to country. We are very grateful for China's Communist Party, and we are grateful for Xi Jinping. And after finish eating, again we have to praise them and thank them. <clears throat> thank you, Chairman. I'm out of time. I'll submit questions for the record. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Carson. Um, uh, thank you both, uh, again, for your powerful testimony. I now invite our other witnesses to join Ms. Haitawaja and Ms. Saduk at the witness table. In the interest of time, as the logistics get ironed out here, I'll, we'll start with the introductions. Uh, we're fortunate tonight to hear from three witnesses with deep expertise about the CCP's genocide of the Uyghur people. Uh, they will help us understand the scale and scope of the CCP's genocide, how it fits within the party's broader strategy and vision for the future, and they'll help us think through what we can do in response. Uh, first, we have Dr. Adrian Zenz, a senior fellow and director of China Studies for the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation. He's a leading scholar on the Uyghur genocide, and his analysis of leaked Chinese government documents, including the China Cables and the Xinjiang Papers, played a paramount role in bringing these atrocities to light. Thank you for being here. We're also very privileged to have uh, uh, Chair Nuri Turkel, chair of the U.S. Commission on International Freedom. Mr. Turkel is also a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and co-founder and chair of the Uyghur Human Rights Project. He is himself Uyghur, and he is one of the foremost advocates for the Uyghur people. And finally, we're grateful to have Ms. Naomi Kikolar, director of the Center for the Prevention of Genocide at the United States Holocaust Museum. She is a powerful advocate for all genocide victims, and we're grateful for her perspective, particularly from a historical angle. Now, let me recognize, before I swear in the witnesses, we've asked them to do something impossible because of the unique uh, sort of format here and in the interest of time uh, to limit their remarks to two minutes, uh, which really is unfair. I just want to commend that their written testimony was absolutely exceptional, but we're hoping to tease out what you can't say in your very, very unfairly short statement through the question and answer. But we thank you for bearing with us. The hour is late, but the subject is very important, and we appreciate your, uh, your help. So thank you again. If you could th uh, the three of you could please stand and raise your right hand. I'll now swear you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Yes, I do. I do. You may be seated. Let the record show that the additional witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Uh, each of our new witnesses will now have two minutes for their opening remarks. Uh, Dr. Zenz, you may begin. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, these witness statements we've heard do not speak of isolated incidents. They reflect a systematic policy. Classified documents outline Beijing's secret plan to subjugate the region. Xi Jinping himself asked Chen Chenguo, experienced with crushing dissent in Tibet, to move to Xinjiang to execute his plan, which began in 2017 with mass internments and ran for five years initially. Xinjiang detained an estimated one to two million ethnic group members in re-education camps and implemented measures to prevent births, leading to unprecedented declines in Uyghur birth rates. The presumed goal of these measures and the intent behind them was to optimize the ethnic population structure, diluting Uyghur populations with Han because concentrated Uyghur populations are considered a national security threat. According to secret speeches by Xi Jinping in 2014, suppressing ethnic resistance in Xinjiang is paramount for achieving the CCP's major 21st century goals. Genocide research says that preventative internment targeting an entire ethnic group is a sign of political paranoia. Political paranoia is an exaggerated threat perception that genocide scholars have linked to all major atrocities in the past 100 years. This paranoia is well worth, worth studying because it also informs the CCP's stance towards everything else, including the United States. Policy recommendation one, 
The US government should sanction implicated current and former central government officials. My written testimony contains a list. So far, the US has not sanctioned a single central government official, even though they are implicated. Having determined genocide in Xinjiang, second, the government should spell out how it will follow through on its treaty obligation to prevent the crime of genocide. Third, the government should establish measures to prevent US investors, such as pension funds, to invest in Chinese entities implicated in human rights violations, surveillance, and military modernization. Thank you. That was very well done in two minutes. Chair Turkle, you are now recognized for two minutes. Good evening. Thank you very much, Chairman Gallagher, uh, Ranking Member Christian Murthy, members of the committee. I'm truly grateful for your leadership in addressing, uh, prioritizing the Uyghur genocide. Uh, the picture that we're looking at and been hearing is bleak. Uh, millions of Uyghur people are still suffering, and the death count is still unknown. The Chinese government, uh, as, as noted earlier today, using high-tech tools like biometric scanning, using forced collection of DNA, iris scans, face scans, and voice prints, combined with mobile phone tracking apps, massive network surveillance cameras, the CCP has mobilized AI machine learning for its total control regime. Congress must also uh, must ensure full enforcement of the Uyghur, Force, uh, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act. This bill requires global Magnitsky sanction on all entities and officials responsible for the atrocities. To date, only 12 Chinese officials and entities currently under GlobeMax sanctions. This is a pitiful response. We need global, GlobeMax sanctions on all the Chinese high-tech giants that are maintaining genocide that tech built. Making these companies no-go zone is long overdue. I urge this committee to focus on China's transnational repression. It is past time to strengthen government authorities to defend U.S. sovereignty and civil liberties under our Constitution. Tonight, I will speak only to my own case as a Uyghur American. Chinese officials have continued to prevent me from seeing my mother, despite involvement by senior officials, including Secretary Blinken and Ambassador Burns. It is extremely, extremely painful to say this, but it is unlikely that I will see my mother again in this life. In fact, my father, and I said goodbyes uh, along with my mother at the time, uh, uh, that when the Chinese government, CCP, started rounding up Uyghur intellectuals and families with foreign contacts. My late father even told me that he wished he died earlier so that he could left this world with good memories. I urge the, urge the committee to address China's massive program of state-imposed forced labor that we can discuss uh, a little bit later. Tonight, you have heard from two brave women. I salute the courage of these two ladies that I call friend, as well as other survivors who have who borne witness from the inside camps. I have 27 uh, uh, recommendations that you can look at. Um, in closing, I wanted to thank the committee. Uh, crimes against humanity cannot be treated merely as an area of dis disengagement or disagreement, worse yet, an irritant in a bilateral relationship. This is truly more than a competition. It is a battle for the world and our children will inherit it. Genocide is defined as an international crime for a reason. Confronting is not an option. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ms. Kukola, you're recognized for two minutes. Thank you, Chairman Gallagher and Ranking Member Krishnamurthy for holding this important hearing today and for shedding light on the plight of the weaker people. Mr. Chairman, I ask that my full statement on the museum's 2021 report to make us slowly disappear be entered into the record in addition with uh, pictures and stories of Uyghurs speaking in interviews with the museum about the unknown fate of their family members. Without objections, ordered. The United States Holocaust Memorial Museum seeks to do for community today what was not done for the Jews of Europe during the Holocaust. The words never again were meant to be a lasting commitment, no matter how challenging, including when a superpower like China is perpetrating the crimes. When most people think of genocide, they think of places like Auschwitz-Birkenau, where over one million Jews were systematically killed. The Chinese government is using subtler tactics to intentionally destroy the Uyghur people. Mass surveillance and detention, torture, transfer of children, separation of men and women, and restrictions on reproductive capacity. These are crimes that impact all, but women in particular, who for too long have been overlooked as the intentional targets of genocide. The Chinese government is failing in its legal obligations to prevent genocide. What then does upholding never again mean in this context? First and foremost, the Chinese government must halt its crimes, 
release detainees and allow, allow unfettered access to independent monitors in Xinjiang. The scale of the crimes against the Uyghurs is daunting, and we know that confronting the crimes of a powerful perpetrator will be difficult. The United States alone cannot prevent these crimes. We must work with other governments, Uyghur civil society, and the private sector to develop swift, coordinated, and a global strategy to protect the Uyghur community. Thus far, no such strategy exists. For more than a decade, it has been official U.S. policy that preventing mass atrocities and genocide is a core national security interest and a core moral responsibility. To live up to this commitment, three prongs must minimally be pursued. First, degrade the capacity of perpetrators to commit further atrocities, for example, via expanding and strengthening enforcement of financial sanctions, targeting commercial entities that are supporting China's repressive policies, and export controls on advanced technologies. Two, persuade perpetrators to stop committing atrocities, for example, by promoting accountability, including through the creation of an independent, impartial investigative mechanism to collect, preserve, and analyze evidence. And three, protect Uyghurs outside China, for example, by providing asylum and refuge from transnational repression. In conclusion, this is our moment to abide by values that the American people hold dear. This is our moment to abide by U.S. strategic interests. On visiting the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum, people often ask themselves, what would I have done had I been alive during the Holocaust? Let history guide us today so that we ask, now that I know what the Chinese government is doing to the Uyghurs, what will I do? This is our never again moment. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. In Ms. Haitawaja's uh, written statement, she writes, please stop pension fund investments in China's high-tech surveillance companies. I was shocked to learn that Americans are pouring their money into Dahua, Hikvision, Huawei, Tencent, and others that we are familiar with as being the power behind the Chinese state's heavy hand over our lives. And Dr. Zenz, in your written testimony, you write, quote, in their endeavor to capture Chinese markets and boost their bottom lines, American corporations have increasingly supported Beijing's military modernization, surveillance state, domestic securitization, and attendant human rights violations. Dr. Zenz, can you elaborate on what this support looks like on a day-to-day -day basis? Thank you. Through mutual funds, for example, um, American investors are investing in a broad range of Chinese companies, and US, the U.S. private sector um, is involved in aiding Chinese efforts. Um, in terms of the U.S. private sector, we have a lot of technology benefit with, West, uh, with American companies uh, doing research together to for some extent, or providing the technology, for example, Intel chips powering cloud computing services in Rumchi that are being used for surveillance and uh, public security and all kinds of uh, other measures. Um, there was a lot of co-development of technology. A lot of that has abated because of the geopolitical situation, but not all of it. It's a big research topic, and a lot of it is unknown or not known. And um, American money is funding a lot of Chinese companies. A lot of that is dual use, so you have uh, companies that are uh, Chinese companies that are um, developing technology and uh, products and solutions that work both for the civilian sector and also for the military sector. Um, these topics are severely under-researched and our current knowledge on these uh, implications and complicities is uh, inadequate. Thank you. Uh, Chair Turkle, similar question. In your written statement, I was struck when you noted that numerous publicly traded Chinese tech companies are included in many emerging market indexes that are held by public pension funds, university endowments, individual retirement plans, and investment portfolios. What role does American capital play in subsidizing the ongoing genocide? And should tax advantaged entities like pension funds or university endowments continue to enjoy that status if they are invested in, even if passively, companies that contribute to the genocide? Chairman Gallagher, that's an important question that has, that, you know, act, acting on that issue is long overdue. Um, this, is, this is happening two ways. Um, the American people, uh, us consumers, continue to fuel this genocide through our purchase um, of the tainted products. We're talking about more than 80 global brands. At the same time, as you eloquently pointed out in the last hearing, that we are uh, investing in not only self-destruction, but also uh, fueling this uh, genocide, the ongoing genocide that is in its seventh year. 
uh, genocide should never happen, let alone being continued for seven years. And also, this is very un-American, that corporate America, uh, as you may recall, when the Uyghur, Human Rights, uh, Uyghur, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act being considered late 2021, U.S. Chamber of Commerce and others were opposing. They lobbied against. Um, that has to stop. What we can do is to not only cause, uh, put them in a reputational risk category, we need to make it, make it criminal, uh, create a, a con criminal consequences for them. It's just like the Foreign uh, Corrupt Practices Act that considers uh, a, a corrupt practices as a criminal act that is handled uh, through law enforcement at SEC and at the Justice Department. So unless you make it difficult, uh, putting, uh, enhancing some legal tools and making it not only immoral and reputational risk for them, but also face consequences, uh, then we might be able to stop this. It's un-American, it's immoral, uh, it's unconscionable practice that is still ongoing. Just a quick follow-up specifically on the university endowments and pension funds and tax advantage entities. Should they enjoy that status? That they, continue? they should not enjoy that status. Thank you, sir. And with that, I uh, yield to the ranking member for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses. Uh, Dr. Zenz, I'd like to start our discussion with the growth of these mass concentration camps uh, of Uyghurs. These so-called, quote unquote, vocational education and retraining centers in Xinjiang started in 2014 and expanded dramatically in 2017. First, I just want to start with a graphic of a parcel of land in Xinjiang uh, in 2015. As you can tell, it's an empty piece of land. But let's see what happened to this very tract of land. In 2017, CCP told the police to, quote, round up everyone who should be rounded up, close quote. And one year later, in 2018, a new internment camp was constructed on this previously empty site. Correct, Dr. Zenz? Uh, yes, that is. Yes, along, along with many others. Uh, this particular facility is a detention center, which are extensively used for extrajudicial re-education, besides uh, the so-called vocational skills training education centers which um, were also erected from 2017. Right. Let me show you a picture of some um, satellite imagery from 2020 of the same piece of land. Over two years, we see an enormous growth of this same camp, multiplying in size, uh, manifold. Interestingly, in 2019, Chinese officials in Xinjiang stated that the forced internment centers were closed and that the detainees had all, quote unquote, graduated. Dr. Zenz, do these camps look closed to you? The Chinese government was referring to the closure of so-called vocational skills education and training centers, which are lower security facilities, such as the one in Kona Shea, where we have evidence from the Xinjiang police files. Um, all of these, the uh, lower security camps were run just like detention centers as prisons, and we have testimony from them. What we see is we see in 2019 a desecuritization of a number of the lower security vocational centers. Uh, that's how they're called, but they are re-education camps. And uh, a drastic, as you correctly point out here, a significant expansion of higher security facilities. Um, we have a trend and we have some uh, witness accounts of Uyghurs being shifted from the re-education facilities both into forced labor and into higher security prison. And we can assume that hundreds of thousands have been shifted into these facilities which have been dramatically expanding. Let me, let me turn your attention to another very disturbing topic. Uh, in your 2020 report on the CCP's campaign to suppress Uyghur birth rates in Xinjiang, you included this chart which shows sterilizations for every 100,000 people in Xinjiang compared to the nation as a whole. And what, what you can see in this chart, uh, you can see it up there as well, but essentially the forced steril, I'm sorry, the sterilization rate for Xinjiang region is much lower from 2010 to 2015 compared to what it is for the nation from 2010 to 2015. But then in 2016, the one-child policy ends the sterilization rate goes down for the nation and it explodes for Xinjiang region. Now, my question to you is this. Um, Dr. Zenz, when a government institutes a massive 
coerced forced sterilization program like this, it's not reflective of a, of a government trying to re uh, provide vocational training or uh, career training to this population, is it? Uh, no, it's not. And it's in fact, vocational a, training is just a euphemism. It's a sign that this government, the CCP, no longer wants these people or their children to exist. Isn't that right? Yeah, the intent behind mass serialization is to reduce weaker birth rates, to dilute the weaker population, which is seen as a national security threat. Concentrated weaker populations are considered a national security threat. And, and this, is, this is ending Uyghur births, in some sense, fits the definition of a genocide, right? Yes. It, the prevention of births is one of the articles of the Genocide Convention from 1948. Mr. Turkle, thank you. Mr. Turkle, this morning the CEO of TikTok, Mr. Chu, was questioned at a hearing before Congress. And at that time, actually, my colleague, Dr. Dunn, cited reports of uh, basically TikTok data being used to surveil Forbes journalists. And Mr. Chu said this was not spying on those journalists. Can you please tell us your opinion about what he said? Well, that's what they do uh, when you look at their practices, uh, starting from ByteDance. ByteDance has a strategic partnership with the uh, Chinese Ministry of Public Security. That's, that's part of their business conduct. Uh, when you look at the way that they built this camp system initially, they relied on something called integrated joint pla uh, operating platform. That joint operating platform used the data from the WeChat then Doyen to build. Uh, Doyen is the is is the, the Chinese equivalent version of, of the TikTok. TikTok. Yes. So so that's you know a lot of Uyghur people to this day don't even know why they're in the camp, why their loved ones in the camp because of this platform, tracing or. Part of the U.S. Gov uh, Chinese government, even today, their representatives in Washington engaging in genocide denial. Mm. Uh, if you listen to the interview with the top lobbyist for the company last year with, uh, with Jake Tapper on CNN, he could not even acknowledge that there's a genocide uh, in China. That, that, that speaks the volume. The gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Whitman is recognized for five minutes. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to thank our witnesses for joining us today. The past two administrations and Congresses have formally designated the CCP's atrocities against the Uyghur people as genocide and crimes against humanity. And when we fail to confront the face of evil, that is the CCP, and the genocide is still underway, then our job is unfinished. The CCP, I believe, bears full responsibility the terrible suffering of the Uyghur people, and they must be held accountable. Today, we've uh, levied a variety of different tools against the CCP in response to these human rights violations. We've had targeted sanctions. We've had export controls and import restrictions. However, I would argue that none of these measures have in any way, shape, or form affected the behavior of the Chinese Communist Party. These have been ineffective and insufficient. It hasn't changed the CCP's calculus towards Xinjiang. My question to the panelists is, what further actions must, must we take to truly alter Beijing's decision-making? How do we also raise this profile in the international community? Because this is of the magnitude where it has to be the United States and our friends and allies around the world, please give us your perspective on how we heighten the sense of urgency on this issue and how we bring to bear the forces necessary to confront this evil. Thank you, Representative Whitman, for that question. I'll, I'll briefly start. I think it's an incredibly important point to respond to the level of threat that is currently facing the weaker people. We need a global and coordinated strategy, and that has been missing thus far. There needs to be greater coordination for the targeted sanctions that exist and also the import restrictions. There should be a process by which we are also, in the U.S. context, evaluating the efficacy of the measures that have already put in, been put in place. 
the Director of National Intelligence could be tasked, for example, to collect intelligence specifically to that and to share that with respective parties. We can also be working to share intelligence with other governments to help share and create a like-minded approach to what needs to be done. We also believe that it's very important for there to be, much as has been stood up in the context of Ukraine, Burma, Syria, an independent investigative mechanism or a commission of inquiry to look into the crimes that are currently being perpetrated by the Chinese government. That information will help put a spotlight, but also, to your point, mobilize the will of others to act together to try to save these people's lives. I'll turn it over to Nuri. A couple of thoughts on this. One is a global aspect. Um, uh, for example, European countries in, in EU, Germany, uh, Italy, for example, need to step up to the plate. They can, uh, and countries as, as Naomi pointed out, Canada, UK, and others that have a similar type of legal tools as we do, such as Global Magnitsky Act, they need to use it. And also domestically, as I noted uh, in my opening remarks, um, Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act need to be fully implemented. To date, we only went after 10, uh, we announced 10 global, global max sanctions. That should be expanded to the banks to find it for financial transactions. That should be expanded to the network. We also need to, uh, to put pressure on the business community, the high-tech community, Silicon Valley to be exact. They're finding ways to uh, still sharing technology, still uh, providing hardware, software support. We need to close the loopholes, and this committee can do that. Thank you. Dr. Zenz? The key is to impose a cost for evil doing. Otherwise, it will not stop. And uh, there's no guarantee that the cost will change the course, but it's the best strategy we have. Firstly, there has to be a personal cost paid by those perpetrating. There have to be sanctions, more sanctions, not just on Chen Quan Guo, but there have to be sanctions on government officials in Beijing who are now directly implicated with internal evidence. Secondly, besides personal cost, there has to be a national cost. The national cost for the CCP is the economic sanctions related to forced labor. Work is done, but things need to be tightened, and products are still entering our country that shouldn't. And third, there has to be a reputational cost for committing genocide. And that requires, in my opinion, besides the multilateral approach and more pressure at the UN, I think the, U uh, the United States can be actually more strategic in the way it works with other countries at the UN in Geneva. But I think that the administration also needs a stronger public communication for the American public. There needs to be much more engagement with the American domestic public. Thank you, Dr. Sands. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Chairman, it's time to expire. Ms. Castor is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Rabadam Mubarak. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Haitawaji and Ms. Sicknick. Uh, for sharing your very courageous stories. Uh, your willingness to tell your stories of the atrocities inflicted upon the Uyghur by the CCP is helping the world understand what is really happening, especially as very few Uyghurs are, have been able to leave China. The genocide of the Uyghurs at the hands of the CCP has also been referred to as the largest incarceration of an ethno-religious minority since the Holocaust. The CCP's policies in the region have been disproportionately perpetrated against women, causing an outsized impact to Uyghur culture. Rape, forced sterilization, ripping families apart, ripping children away from their parents. Um, and because of this, it's imperative that the Uyghur women's voices are included from the beginning. So I do appreciate the chair and the ranking member making that happen here tonight. So Ms. Kikoler, how can this committee help amplify the Uyghur women's voices and experience? As you said, we need a global and coordinated strategy. What role, uh, how can we elevate the women's experiences to, to tell their stories and, and change what's happening? Thank you so much, Representative Castor, for that question. I think it's really important uh, what you're doing, first and foremost, in actually putting and drawing attention to the fact that the manner in which the Chinese government is perpetrating these crimes really singles out and focuses on the experiences of women. The conception of genocide consists of a number of different pillars, but within them include specifically imposing measures that would restrict birth, transferring children, 
and also other measures that would cause bodily harm. And we know from the history of the Holocaust that unfortunately it can be very difficult to uh, understand the real nature of crimes that are being occurring. Uh, that can be due to taboos around talking about sexual violence. It can be due to the difficulties in accessing uh, witnesses and survivors. And it's really critical, as you are doing right now, that you're explaining the way in which these crimes are being uh, perpetrated so that people understand, but that also so that government leaders in Beijing know that the world is watching and is aware that what they are doing behind closed doors, what they are doing within these camps, is something that the world is aware of, thanks to the incredibly courageous efforts of the two women beside us and of so many others that are telling their story. I think that there is additional support that could be provided to survivors who have been able to leave. It is very difficult for people to leave China and seek refuge elsewhere, but there are people whose stories need to be told. We need to actually have a process in place to collect in a systematic way their testimony, to gather their evidence. We've made great strides, sadly, as a result of contemporary genocides that have been perpetrated where women have also been targeted, be that the uh, victims of the ISIS-related crimes, the victims of the uh, Tatmadaz crimes in Burma against the Rohingya. We've developed ways in which we can interview survivors of gender-based violence and sexual violence in a trauma-sensitive manner. But what we haven't done in this particular case is specifically gone ahead with supporting those documentation efforts, supporting Uyghur civil society doing that, or creating an international mechanism for doing it. So a very big way that we could support women right now is in making sure that their stories are told to help create a historical record, but also advance accountability. And then, of course, through providing uh, refugee assistance, through asking governments, in neighboring countries to protect Uyghur communities so that they are not sent back to China to face future crimes, and so that we can also work to protect those who are speaking out. People like Roshan Abbas, whose sister sadly was taken after she spoke out about her experiences. So I think there are a number of different steps that can be taken to specifically help women, and I applaud you for putting an emphasis on, on that particular issue. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm gonna ask uh, Ms. Sitnik and Ms. Hyde to to answer uh, for the record, to, to, to help us highlight the, the role of women and what specifically can be done to elevate their stories and, and have us take action. And I'll yield back. Great. Thank you. Mr. Luke DeMar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all the witnesses for your compelling testimony and sacrifice to be here and the, all the background you're giving us this evening. It's very, very vital to us. Um, one, of the, one of the numbers that has come across my desk is that in order for the Chinese Communist Party, i.e. government, to continue to oppress their people, to surveil them, detain them, and put them in detention camps, it takes about $300 billion a year. Is that a figure that you've heard before, could verify at all? Dr. Zenz, perhaps? Dr. Mr. Turkle, Turkel? Is it close? Do you have an idea? I, I think that figure is close. Here's why I think it's, it's a reasonable number. The, when you look back, the, the time that they start uh, building those over 400 camps and installing those cameras, they invested zillions of dollars. And now this become a political economy. This is why they've been aggressively exporting their digital uh, surveillance equipment. We're talking about more than 80 countries around the world that include some democratic nations uh, importing, adopting the China surveillance. And also the exportation of slave labor produced products also okay. part of their political. You made, you made my point. Thank you very much for that. The point is that it takes billions of dollars a year for them to do this. And where they get the money from? This is a concern. And in your testimony, yeah. uh, Mr. Turkel, you indicate and name names, which thank you for that. Yeah. Because I think it's time we start naming names of companies that do business, companies that fund these people, people and, and companies that are engaging and supporting this type of activity. You name uh, Vanguard, BlackRock, HSBC, Fidelity, and other pension funds. I can tell you from being on the Financial Services Committee, the CEO of BlackRock recently made the comment that the best place to invest in the next 20 years is China. That can't happen. But it is happening. And those guys are, should be responsible, as you just said a while ago, for that sort of activity. So by naming those folks, how, how are they getting those dollars into the to these different companies over there that are, are helping with the atrocities? 
They raised funds. Uh, uh, one of those uh, companies in the midst of pandemic was bragging about raising $100 million, $140 million in China, just China alone. Uh, Ray Dalio, um, he was publicly acknowledging that his business is thriving. And also uh, hedge funds, uh, venture capitalist firms in Silicon Valley are still making zillions of dollars. You know, one of the things uh, back in 2020, there were a thousand Chinese companies on our stock exchange. And then we invested, United States invested a trillion dollars in those companies, right. a trillion dollars. We put in place a provision that said they had to be audited every two years, because many of them are shell companies and they're just running the money through those companies into the government. And that alone knocked almost three quarters of those companies off the list. So as of January 9th, that list is 252. But we're still investing in, the company, in, in, in this country. Our trade deficit's $383 billion. That's enough to keep the government funded to be able to detain and oppress their own people. How do, you, how, do you, how do you get the message across the American people that we've got to stop looking to Chinese products, we've got to start looking for our own, be willing to pay an extra dollar or two or 10, whatever it is, for an American-made product or a product made somewhere else in the world versus that of a Chinese-produced product? Borrowing the, um, a quotable line from Under Secretary Silvers, I think, um, I believe forced labor is a cancer of value. American people is, need to stop purchasing knowingly. Now everything we touch, solar panels, uh, pharmaceuticals, uh, PPEs, beauty products. As you may have seen, uh, CNN reported uh, the Uyghur woman uh, uh, hair products being sold. 13 tons of uh, hair products were seized by the CBP. How many shipments did we miss? What else did I have been sending? And they labeled these products as black gold. People need to know that we are complicit in the ongoing genocide. One quick more question. I noticed you come, you come in here with the International Finance Corporation, which is a development arm of the World Bank. Yep. Is, it allows China access to their funds. And technically, in order to be able to do that, they are supposed to be a developing nation, which they are, not, well, they are no way that they're there at this point. How would you suggest us to fix that problem? The, the uh, World Bank and IFC have been funding entities that are building those camps. Uh, years ago... They, they are funding the entities the that World are directly Bank, building these camps. Is that there is an entity called XPCC, Xinjiang okay. Con uh, Production Construction Corps. That were using funds from the World Bank. This was, there were hearings hold uh, in the United States Congress years ago. People didn't pay attention to it. And this is the company that, this is the entity that uh, the US government sanctioned on the Global Magnitsky Act. And also largely responsible for the ongoing forced labor practices. Fantastic, thank you so much, I yield back. Thank you, and I commend the fireside chat you did with Undersecretary Silver. It's uh, available in podcast form. It's good listening. Uh, Mr. Moulton is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first, I want to thank the witnesses for being here, for your bravery in speaking out. You've given us some of the most powerful testimony I've ever heard in my life. And it should not be lost on any of us that this genocide is happening today, not at some distant time in history. It's happening on our generation's watch. Mr. Zenz, you spoke in your testimony about the paranoia of Xi Jinping and the CCP being a driving factor behind this repression. I can only imagine two fundamental reasons that the CCP and Xi might undertake this quest to control, subdue, and ultimately eliminate Uyghurs. One is out of fear for the impact that this might have on his hold on power and his strategic goals for China. The second is out of some ethno-nationalist urge for China to be purely Han Chinese. To what degree are each of these at play here? The CCP is profoundly insecure in the face of competing ideologies. Uh, it is a totalitarian system. So um, the important thing to recognize is that the worldview of the CCP is an ideology where its own ideology has to be dominant in every citizen. And there are two strategies for that. There's firstly ideological assimilation and second ethnocultural or racial assimilation. And with ethnic groups such as the Uyghurs, you have both problems. You have the problem that eth they're ethnically different and so harder to control. There's a religion, different language, uh, culture at play. 
So assimilation is one important aspect of this fear complex. But the other one is the, the loyalty, the inner loyalty. Uh, and that's why in the re-education camps, they learn to give thanks and they simulate the prayer before meals or the singing before meal by giving thanks for, to Xi Jinping and the CCP for giving me food uh, before they consume the meager ration they get in the camp. Um, in my opinion, what happened in Xinjiang is the Uyghurs were the ones who really challenged the CCP's ability to control a region. And they realized at the end of the day, because the loyalty of the Uyghurs is not primarily to the Chinese Communist Party and the government, therefore every Uyghur is a potential threat. And I think that's how that expanded. If you look at it, initially there were four types of people to be targeted for re-education. Later on there were 21 types of Uyghurs to be targeted for re-education. If you look at the psychology of how a mass atrocity happens, it's basically a desire for a security that's unattainable because you can't control a human soul. That desire and the fear to not be able to do it spiral out of control. And that's where you move from trying to just arrest individual people who have actually planted a bomb against the police and you preemptively in turn 10 to 20 percent of an entire ethnic group. That's paranoia and that comes out of the fear that results from the desire to control but you can't control the human soul. I hope it's a very complex topic to discuss in the hearing but I hope I've touched on it. Well it's a profound level of fear and insecurity from an autocrat who wants to be the most powerful man in the world. Last hearing, the committee heard a statistic that China spends more than any other country in the region on its military, but it spends even more than that on internal security. I'd imagine that no small amount of that money is going to the enormous technological infrastructure that the Chinese Communist Party is using to perpetrate this genocide and the accompanying societal repression. China has over half the world's security cameras, surveillance cameras. It uses highly advanced fa facial recognition to know where its citizens are and monitor what they are doing. And then it uses AI to identify citizens for further persecution. Mr. Turkle, could you describe for us what it is like to walk around the city of Xinjiang, surrounded by this technology of repression? How frequently do Uyghur residents encounter security cameras, checkpoints? What happens at those checkpoints? It is, it is a, a total controlled uh, uh, police state. Uh, Leninist police state. Um, now it has gotten to the point of the Uyghur homes having the uh, QR codes on the door. Uh, the government could track, you know, who lives there, what kind of family history, travel history, family connection. They also um, forcibly install um, uh, spying apps on the mobile phones. This is precisely why our fellow Americans here in the United States even cannot comfortably contact their family members out of concern that one phone call, one text message, one video chat may end up uh, causing them trouble, if not straight to the concentration camps. On this note, I want to also mention something that the U.S. government did, uh, didn't get much media attention. Late 2021, uh, a U.S. Commerce Department uh, added to the entity list of a military medical academy uh, and its 11 affiliates for developing brain control weaponry. That has not uh, attracted enough attention. Commerce Secretary specifically said that that weapon to be used on ethno-religious groups. Thank you. So that gives you an idea what kind of uh, uh, tech total totalitarian state that we're talking about. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Barr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And tonight's uh, testimony uh, 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 about the genocide of the Uyghur people, the mass internment, the rape, the torture, the sexual abuse, the forced sterilization, the forced abortions, the heartbreaking forced separation of parents from children, the psychological abuse and coercion, all of these human rights atrocities point to the urgent need for moral and intellectual clarity. What we do not need is nuance or ambiguity. We must face the truth that there is a very real struggle between religious tolerance and an evil, toxic intolerance by the CCP, a paranoid depravity that says that if you are a religious minority or a person of faith who fails to conform with the CCP's rigid party state ideology, then you must be destroyed. 
This CCP ideology of evil, extreme religious intolerance, and immoral disregard for basic human rights must be confronted, and we must impose costs, as Dr. Zenz testifies. Because the longer it's not confronted, the more the CCP will be emboldened and the more lives will be shattered. So tonight, let's affirm the objective superiority of U.S. Western values of individual freedom, and dignity, religious liberty, freedom of conscience, and political democracy over the repressive features of Chinese communism and the CCP's brutal surveillance state totalitarianism. As many of us are aware, the People's Republic of China was elected to the United Nations Human Rights Council. According to the United Nations, the Human Rights Council is, quote, responsible for strengthening the promotion and protection of human rights around the globe and for addressing situations of human rights violations. To any of our witnesses, what message does it send to the Uyghur people and to other oppressed groups around the globe that China continues to hold a seat on the United Nations Human Rights Council? It, it sends a, a very uh, disturbing message, to say the least. We have seen time and time again, uh, most recently, there was a motion to debate on the uh, Human Rights uh, Commission, High Commissioner's report on the Xinjiang government's genocide of the Uyghurs. We could not even secure 17, uh, 19 votes, so the other side won. So it's a, it's a place for the Chinese government to uh, abuse its um, seat. That's just one piece of it. Now, President Biden argued that rejoining the UN Human Rights Council would give the United States a seat at the table to stop ongoing human rights abuses. Can any of our witnesses identify specifically what relief the United States has been able to achieve through the UN Human Rights Council since rejoining in October of 2021? Arguably, the presence of the UN, uh, the United States on the UN Human Rights Council has been um, a positive contribution, especially for the women of Iran right now, who are fighting every day for their freedoms. I think also in the instance of the case of the Uyghurs, the US did attempt to uh, put a focus on this. And I think what it surfaced was just how incredibly sophisticated the Chinese government's efforts are to counter the efforts of the US and like-minded governments and why it's so important for us to redouble our work in trying to make sure that we are using every possible avenue that exists to raise the plight of the Uyghurs. It exposed just how far the Chinese government will do. And why is that important? It shows that they do care about their reputation. They do find ways to get other actors to uh, voice support. Uh, I know that that might not seem like a significant change in behavior, but I think it is notable that they are monitoring. They're monitoring uh, evenings like today. They're monitoring discussions that are happening in Geneva, at the General Assembly, within the Security Council. I would argue that the plight of the Uyghurs is a situation that should not just be relegated to conversations within the Human Rights Councils. It's a conversation that be, should be taken before the General Assembly and before the Security Council. And I know that as one of the permanent five members of the Security Council, that makes it incredibly difficult but the Chinese government and the actions, uh, the commission of these crimes against the Uyghur people is a threat to international peace and security, and as such, should be something that is brought before the Security Council. Thank you. And Dr. Zenz, um, uh, can you uh, elaborate on your written testimony about um, uh, the fact that not a single member of the Standing Committee of the Politburo has been designated for the role in the ongoing genocide uh, in Xinjiang? And, and, men, and let's uh, highlight... Uh, the speech from uh, Chen Quanggo, who uh, led the efforts in, in, in the concentration camps in Xinjiang, who, who referenced the general secretary who, quote, sent me to Xinjiang, first not in order to merely be an official, not in order to make a fortune, not in order to have nothing but an empty title. The general secretary sent me to Xinjiang in order to make a stable Xinjiang arise. Yes. We have from these classified documents now unprecedented evidence of central government involvement in the atrocity of Xi Jinping himself uh, commandeering Chen Quanggo as party secretary, moving him from Tibet to Xinjiang. In Zhao, uh, Zhao, uh, the speech of China's national minister of public security from 2018, he said that Xi Jinping was aware that uh, the prison capacity in Xinjiang was, an uh, was a problem, that they needed more prison capacity and that um, 
the central government in Beijing was promising money to hire more prison guards. This is a speech from June 2018. And I think it's a severe deficiency that the United States government has not gone and sanctioned some of the central government officials, not just in Xinjiang, because I think that that's a political problem because it communicates to the Chinese government what they are saying, namely that it's a local issue, not a national issue. But the problem is the atrocity is a national issue, but you only make it a national issue if you go after perpetrators in Beijing. Thank I you. think that would send a major signal to the Chinese government. The gentleman's you, time has expired. Back. Mr. Kana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to the witnesses for your very powerful testimony. And I echo my colleagues that I admire very much your courage in being here. I appreciate, Dr. Zenz, your work, early work, in describing this as a genocide, which now uh, the State Department, our State Department, has recognized. I understand that your early work estimated that there were about a million people who have been detained. I wonder, what is the number today? The latest evidence from the Xinjiang police files, both from the speech of China's National uh, Minister of Public Security, Zhao Kezhi, who estimates that over two million people in southern Xinjiang are infected by religious extremism requiring treatment, and spreadsheets, extensive spreadsheets, based on nearly 300,000 individuals in one county indicating an internment of between 12 and 12 and a half percent of the entire county's ethnic adult population. Based on these data points, um, my current estimate of mass internment in the region uh, is broadly between one and two million, and it's on purpose a range because we don't have anything precise. But we can now with greater, I think, accuracy and authority say that very likely between one and two million were detained at some point. We just don't know who's been released, who's been shifted, where we've seen this huge prison complex. Um, and unfortunately, actually, just in January this year, after the protests in Urumqi, after the fire, I've been hearing reports of a new wave of detention, at least in Urumqi and possibly in other cities. There's nothing so more detailed. So currently about one to two million are detained? I would say one to two million in total have been detained. The current detention numbers are very difficult to ascertain. Mr. Turkle, would you know what the current detention is? Uh, you know, I, I, I rely on what the Chinese government says uh, in its white paper, stating that since 2015, 1 1.3 million Uyghurs went through a re-education program. If you add them up, you come up with a staggering number. They said this in a, a white paper. It has been widely cited. I guess what I'm trying to drive it, I agree, I admire your work on yeah. genocide, and I'm trying to understand what is going to be effective U.S. policy to try to get those numbers down and to try to help in human rights. And so is the situation improving? Is it getting worse? Do we have any sense? I think we can be, we can, there's a lot of indication that the mass internments peaked sometime in 2018, probably the second half of 2018. People were beginning to be released from the camps into forced labor in late 2018, 2019. More people were being released by the end of 2019, but also quite a few were shifted to high security internment facilities, uh, uh, such as prisons, high security prisons, an unknown percentage. My estimate is several hundred thousand at least were shifted into forced labor. Probably Let several hundred thousand at least shifted to Let me prisons. ask the question this way, maybe. What, what would either of you say has been the most effective U.S. policy that has had an impact in helping Uyghurs in China? The Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act. And, and to you, Mr. Turkle, and, and also in your testimony, I was very surprised. I'm sure you're right that all these things are still coming uh, from the Uyghur region, because I would have assumed that the Forced Labor Act would have prevented that. Is that just not being enforced, or how are all these Here, products Here's the good in? news. Um, uh, you know, not, this is not a lost cause. We are, um, even though this genocide is still underway, still we don't know how many people being detained and died. We're seeing some um, uh, progress just to, uh, today in the news that uh, more than 50% of 900 American companies being surveyed in Beijing, in China. 
said they're not in favor of investing in China. So that's a good news. And also, a couple of years ago, Washington Post reported that one a major uh, yarn supplier were kind of complaining in their stock, ex stock ex exchange report that they lost significant amount of money. On the economic side, yes. But on the political side, uh, in a bilateral, uh, multilateral aspect, no. So as, if you can, the, there's a back and forth. Some days we hear strong positions, strong statements. Some days some, we, we hear lukewarm responses and statements. And if we have been doing this alone, this has to be a global endeavor. That way we might be able to, uh, uh, to, to be able to help in a certain way. Representative Connett, may I answer as well? Okay, my time is Briefly, uh, if you would. I just wanted to make note that perpetrators shift their tactics in response to evolving conditions. And I think we need to be very careful when asking and trying to ascertaining that question of, of where have we seen behavioral change. We need to actually task the intel community to look specifically for that type of information to help guide the efforts that are being undertaken. There has to be greater enforcement. There are serious concerns that forced labor is increasingly being an area that is now being pushed underground, whereby, yes, we might see a movement away from the types of products that could be coming to the United States, but could be going to other countries that are part of the Belt and Road Initiative. So we need to be monitoring how the Belt and Road Initiative and those outputs are potentially being impacted by forced labor coming from Xinjiang and other ways in which that, uh, that is having an impact. Thank you. Thank you. Gentleman's time has expired. Mr. Newhouse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I, I too would like to thank the, the first two witnesses, the two ladies, uh, for sharing um, your testimony and your experience at the hands of the CCP. I want to thank you for bringing to the top of our conscience and our awareness uh, here in the United States uh, the plight of the Uyghur people and the genocide they're experiencing in China. Um, I have a question uh, either for Mr. Tur Turkle or Mr. Tur or Dr. Tur Zentz, I believe. Um, yeah. Xinzi, I'm sorry I pronounced it, but the location Xinjiang. Um, has polysilicon production uh, for solar panels, which let me tell you has truly uh, wreaked havoc in the, our domestic manufacturing in my district uh, particularly all while using forced labor and selling panels around the world. We also believe that there are, in this area of China, there are non-ferrous minerals, cobalt, gold, silver, platinum, palladium. Do we know if there are other critical minerals? And on both of these issues, uh, how can we further address sanctions and on these minerals and the products that are coming from uh, Xinjiang, from China. So with polysilicon, um, it's a bit like cotton. Xinjiang produces 90% of the cotton in China. And so with polysilicon, it's a very high percentage. So there's a very high risk that anything uh, polysilicon solar related from China is implicated in Xinjiang. And so one uh, strategy or the strategy to go for is to divest from China in that respect, to build Western capacity, uh, both for the procurement of the raw materials and the construction of the solar panels. So basically, this is a matter of shifting supply chains. In terms of the general risk, um, a lot of people are not aware. So this is not just a matter of cotton, polysilicon, uh, tomatoes, and other products. Uh, these supply chains have been very specifically implicated. But Xinjiang has two complementary systems of forced labor, one directly out of the camps, the other one out of highly coercive poverty elevation, scooping up villages uh, and rounding them up, basically. And as a result, uh, we have a forced labor problem that extends into a very wide range of industries. Xinjiang is being used because of cheap energy to produce um, products that are very high energy intensive, such as the production of polysilicon. So that constitutes a particular risk. Thank you, Dr. Shins. Um, Chair Turkle, your testimony highlights the danger posed by university research collaboration with Chinese entities that uh, may facilitate advances in surveillance technology. Yeah. Uh, what obligations would you say do foreign universities owe the, the Uyghur people to ensure that joint research does not contribute to the ongoing genocide? At, at the very least, should the 
U.S. government ensure that federal research dollars do not go to entities in China that may contribute to the genocide, um, the PLA advances, or other human rights in China? Certainly. Uh, there are a number of issues involving our universities. One is research, as you alluded. The other one is self-centering. Uh, we're not hearing the vocal China scholars today publicly condemning, uh, for the most part, except for several Xinjiang scholars, or Uyghur scholars, still self-censoring. They're sometimes just disturbingly echo, echo uh, CCP propaganda. And also, um, uh, one other point to your uh, research question, uh, re research-related questions. Uh, a few years ago, there was a professor at Yale Medical School, Kenneth Kidd, was implicated being widely reported for him bringing in a lab assistant from uh, 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 China's Minister of Public Security to conduct research on Uyghur DNA. So that gives you an idea what kind of problems that we have. We're talking about the university endowments, but we have a research projects that have been uh, aiding and abating some of the unstated stated goals of the CCP government. That includes scientific research, that includes technological uh, engineering field, that also includes biomedical research. That needs to stop. Well, thank you very much. And again, thanks to all of you for your testimony this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much for coming and, and sharing this very powerful testimony. And we would be doing a great disservice to your courage and bravery if we don't come out of this with some concrete steps and actions that we can take to move forward. Uh, Mr. Turkill, um, I, I wanted to start with you. Uh, you laid out some very specific proposals in your testimony, laying out uh, some steps that the Secretary of State and other senior officials can do go more going forward, yeah. or increasing diplomatic efforts to nations hosting Uyghurs or, or other uh, Muslim-majority nations. You even mentioned this idea of a State Department China regional office program expansion. Can you talk a little bit more about the important role that State Department and diplomacy can make here? Yes, uh, first of all, um, Congressman Kimber, thank you for asking that question. First of all, we have to elevate um, human rights in our uh, dialogue with, the, with, the, with, the, with Beijing. They elevated human rights, religious freedom issues as part of their pushback against Western influence starting 2014. That had been integrated into Chinese national security strategy. Where are we? We're still making human rights, religious freedom, individual freedom, press freedom, a kind of a secondary issue that needs to change. Two, we need to revisit our strategies, uh, specifically communication strategies. We have to continue to call it genocide. It's a US policy two successive administrations, and this Congress yeah. uh, recognizes the genocide along with uh, our par partners and allies in, in the Western democracy, including Taiwan. So we have to call it genocide, crimes against humanity. That message needs to be repeated every day. And then three, we have to engage uh, like-minded governments, even the governments that are lukewarm. I do a fair amount of uh, international travel as part of the uh, China Regional, uh, uh, Regional China uh, Officers Program. We have only 19 around the world. Uh, each officer had about $50,000 budget. That need to be increased. Yeah, and that's yep. something that I thought, you know, Ms. Ms. Kikuler, um, you mentioned something earlier in this uh, uh, hearing where you talked about, for instance, uh, maybe you know, taking further steps to engage with the UN General Assembly and other nations in that kind of capacity. Uh, what I'm taking away from this, would you agree with the idea that it's vital for the United States to engage with the UN and other international organizations in the same way that, that Mr. Turkle was talking about with other nations as well? It is absolutely essential for the U.S. to be engaging in uh, constant dialogue with those organizations, but also in those international fora. Under the Trump administration, one of the really important things that they did was they actually convened a high-level meeting at the United Nations, including senior UN officials, to raise the profile of the plight of the Uyghurs, of which many of the people in this room participated. It was one of the first instances in which the discussion of the Uyghurs and the commission of the crimes against them was actually brought to the international fora. It's really important that we continue to see that ongoing level of putting a face to the crimes, yeah. and that we do that before uh, the UN bodies. Thank you. And I, I really think that this hearing is so important. If, if first of all highlights the atrocities that are happening, but it also is showing us why we need to have a comprehensive approach. Why we need to use all the tools at our disposal here. You know, this is something that where we recognize that this crisis demands more diplomatic action, more coalition building with nations and institutions around the world and more efforts in that capacity here. We have an office, we have offices and, and people at the State Department and elsewhere charged with this, 
the Bureau of Human Rights, Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor, others working with refugees and humanitarian assistance, but I believe they can do more. Ms. Kikuler, would you agree that it would be productive if we can take what we heard today and work in a bipartisan way to increase our support for these diplomatic efforts at State Department and USAID? Yes, without a doubt. I mean, I think we're in a situation where, as we've all stated before, there can be no single country that is going to solve the problem right now that is facing the weaker community. We have to have a multilateral and an international response to the crimes that are occurring. The role of Congress is absolutely critical. In 2018, there was the passage of the Elie Wiesel Genocide and Atrocity Prevention Act, of which many of you uh, co-sponsored and signed on to it. It explicitly said that the prevention of these types of crimes is a core national security interest of the U.S. government. Yeah. You have the ability to ask the current administration what they are doing to integrate the protection of the weaker people in broader China policy and what that means both in terms of domestic but also international engagement. Thank you. What, what, what I hope we think through here is, because uh, I'm a little worried here, because I was just in a Foreign Affairs Committee hearing earlier today with Secretary Blinken, and there were serious concerns raised there that the Republican majority is considering steps like returning to FY22 budget list spending levels or other spending proposals that could levy billions of dollars of budget cuts on the State Department and USAID. Now, in our last hearing, we heard a lot about the need to be able to surge resources when it comes to our military might and deterrence. And today, I hope we take these unbelievably powerful testimonies and heed the call to invest in our diplomacy, our global coalition building, and to encourage and surge our work with international institutions. And I hope all of us on both sides of the aisle commit to increasing, not decreasing, our investment in diplomacy with the same urgency as we talk about for our military. Thank you, and I yield back. Gentlemen's time has expired, Mr. LaHood. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank our witnesses for being here this evening and your valuable testimony, and especially uh, the powerful and sobering testimony from the brave women who spoke on our first panel. Much of what has been shared this evening is a powerful reminder of how fortunate we are to be living in the United States, to have the freedoms guaranteed to us. The treatment of the Uyghur people by the Communist Chinese Party resembles that of a dark, dystopian novel. And hearings like this are essential in alerting Congress and the American people that these acts are not some far-fetched fictional event. They are real and they are happening as we speak. The United States must continue to play an active role in condemning this egregious treatment through a combination of directed humanitarian, economic, and diplomatic efforts. As we look at the global economy and international trade, we need to be vigilant in all levels of our supply chains. Turning a blind eye to forced labor practices cannot be tolerated, regardless of the circumstances. Mr. Turkle, as we, uh, as we previously mentioned, passage of the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act by the Congress was a great step expressly combating uh, against these forced labor practices, particularly in the Xinjiang uh, region. But our work is obviously far from finished. In your, in your view, what should some of the immediate next steps be for the Congress to take? Is it looking at the sectors currently labeled as high priority by the Department of Homeland Security and considering new sectors that should be added? Or are there other steps that should be taken first? Three things. One, thank you uh, for the question. First, we need to uh, have a full briefing. This, this committee could uh, organize a full briefing on the obstacles to fully implement this significant law. And then two, we need to um, close the uh, uh, black hole a, uh, as part of the USMCA uh, uh, agreement that uh, bans forced labor produced products. But the Xinjiang exports are still making it to the United States, reportedly through Mexico and Canada. So that needs to be addressed. And then also uh, Europe has is, is been a dumping ground. There's no national or European uh, uh, parliament, European Union level of uh, engagement or policy responses, responses have been announced. A um, Couple of years ago, there was a report published by USCIS. It, it reported Italy. In the year 2019-2003, uh, uh, 2020, the export volume to Italy from Xinjiang doubled. So we have, we have uh, Europe being still 
one of the uh, continued destination for us. So we have to get, get into European, get Europeans and other allies, even including Japan, including Australia, to essentially do something that this Congress did. Thank you for that. Uh, I think we can all agree that in order for there to be some sort of meaningful change, we're going to need uh, more commitments from our al allies around the globe and also be really taking constructive steps to combat these atrocities. I think the hypocrisy is, uh, and the irony is, when you look at the Arab world, uh, who obviously many of the Sunni countries share a uh, religious heritage with the Uyghurs. And I want to, uh, it was mentioned earlier uh, about the Belt and Road Initiative by uh, Ms. Uh, Ki Kalar. Uh, I want to read uh, a statement here that's in an article from June 2nd, 2022, titled, Why Muslim Countries in the Middle East Support Chinese Atrocities in Xinjiang. Here's what it says. Chinese Belt and Road Initiatives projected to grow to over one trillion by 2027 are especially important for Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and the UAE, all of which have signed comprehensive strategic partnerships, one of the highest levels of Belt and Road partnership with China. Consequently, each of these states has firmly defended China's oppressive actions in Xinjiang. In addition to publicly endorsing China's Xinjiang policies, all of these countries have deported Uyghurs back to China at Beijing's request. The defensive, real, the, the defensive motivations and behavior are clear. Egypt and Saudi Arabia uh, want to continue the Belt and Road initiatives with, uh, with China. I'm going to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, three articles. One from Time Magazine from March 24th, 2022, titled, The Arab World Isn't Just Silent on China's Crackdown on Uyghurs, It's Complicit. Uh, number two, from The Hill, uh, December 9th, 2022, Arab nations should press China on Uyghur Muslim abuses. And thirdly, the article I just talked about from the Institute for the Study of Democracy, June 2nd, 2022, why Muslim countries in the Middle East support Chinese atrocities. Without objection, it'll be added to the record. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Ms. Cheryl. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And once again, an incredibly heartfelt thank you to Ms. Haidawaji and Ms. Siddick for your truly moving testimony to hear about the unique vulnerabilities of women being exploited um, by the genocide taking place in China right now is really heartbreaking. And quite frankly, equally heartbreaking is um, hearing about how young people are at these camps. I have two teenagers, and to hear that 17 and 18 year olds are uh, being exploited in the same ways at these camps is horrifying. So thank you for your testimony, for the courage it takes um, when I know you must fear for family members and relatives at home. Thank you as well, Mr. Turkle. Uh, again, horrible to hear you, you may never see your parents again. Um, and the courage that you've shown as well, it, it really, I think, humbles all of us here tonight. So thank you. Um, we heard tonight some testimony about uh, the Chinese TikTok company and how they have participated in the surveillance architecture of the state and have been complicit in the genocide taking place against the Uyghurs. And yet, at a hearing earlier today when TikTok CEO Chu was asked about this, he said, quote, I'm here to discuss TikTok and what we do as a platform. It seems as if a more complete answer would have included what TikTok does as a platform to help architect the surveillance state, uh, which has been involved in these atrocities. But it's not TikTok alone. We know that Chinese technology companies, many of which still do business here in the United States, are providing surveillance and tracking technology that not only enable the surveillance state in China, but also uh, for would-be autocrats across the world. So Representative Pfluger and I have legislation, the Uyghur Human Rights Sanctions Review Act. That would give President Biden the authority to sanction these companies under the Global Magnitsky Act, and I think my colleagues on this committee could be instrumental in getting that legislation across the finish line, and that's something I will work to do um, along with them. 
Uh, we have taken steps, important steps, as we've heard, um, like the Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act, and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law to boost incentives to reshore our supply chains and reward those companies that do the right thing. But we all know tonight more must be done, and I look forward to working with the members of this committee to finish that work. So given the secrecy of Beijing's human rights abuses in Xinjiang and the difficulty in finding information on the labor used to produce goods for export, how can the U.S. government, how can we do better at making sure we are further boosting insights into how certain products are made in China and making sure that we have a supply chain that does not involve labor from Xinjiang or exporting that through third-party countries back into the United States. Um, and Mr. Turkle, Mr. Zentz, if you'd like to reply. First of all, uh, Congresswoman, thank you so much for your um, uh, sympathy with my family situation. Um, um, I wish the circumstances will change, and I will welcome my mother back to the United States to uh, meet her American children uh, and American grandchildren. She has five U.S.-born uh, grandchildren, but she only met one so far. Uh, it's painful. It's extremely painful. Um, to your question, um, two, a couple of things need to be uh, taken into consideration. One. As I alluded earlier, there, the, this bill has faced some challenges. Um, it is almost disturbing to hear the folks uh, who are advocating uh, co cooperation with China on climate crisis wanted to water this down. That's a wrong approach. Laws meant to be made to be implemented. We need to fully implement this law. And then the other thing that we need to look into is uh, close the loopholes within China. There, we've been receiving news regarding human trafficking, uh, transporting uh, Uyghur workers to inland China. We're also hearing uh, uh, change of labels, uh, country of origin. Technology should be able to address that. Uh, I recently spoke at the Tech Expo organized by CBP. They're talking about using DNA technology to trace. So technology, um, and also consumer advocacy is also very important. Um, General Lady's time has expired. Dr. Dunn. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, I want to echo the sentiments of all my colleagues in thanking Ms. Hadawaja and Ms. Saduk for their testimonies. Speaking here, uh, reliving your experience takes immense courage and strength. Uh, uh, Americans and people around the world need to hear your story. So thank you very much. Um, as the chair mentioned, we stand ready to help and uh, build off some of our earlier progress. During the 117th Congress, we passed uh, H.R. 6256 to ensure that goods made with forced labor in the Xinjiang Uyghur region of China do not enter the United States market. Just three months ago, we passed H.R. 4785, the Uyghur Human Rights Policy Act, which uh, passed the House with broad bipartisan support. This bill will address human rights violations uh, committed against Uyghurs and other minority groups in the Xinjiang uh, region. Still, there's a lot more work to be done, and I thank the chairman for his leadership uh, in fighting this egregious human rights abuse. Uh, you know, forced mo movements, forced labor, torture, brainwashing, genocide, all at the hands of CCP. The list goes on. Personally, I'm particularly disturbed by the Chinese Communist Party's forced organ harvesting practice. As a physician, I know the miracle of organ transplantation. It's life-saving for many people. For those who choose, and I emphasize choose, to donate organs, they're doing great service to others. However, the need for organs is much greater than the number of donations can meet. Uh, according to the United Network for organ sharing, more than 100,000 people in the United States need an organ transplant, but last year just 43,000 transplants occurred. So how is it that in China, wait times for hearts and lungs are significantly shorter than in other countries? In fact, articles suggest that patients are even given their dates of surgery well in advance. 
This seemingly unlimited supply of organs tells us the organs are harvested on demand, on demand. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to enter into the record statement of Mr. Ethan Gutman on uh, forced organ, organ harvesting in China. With no exception? With, no, with no, no objection. Thank you. In May of 22, uh, a Tom Lantos Commission hearing, human rights investigators uncovered that detainees of about 28 years old in the camps were undergoing health checks that included blood tests and cross matches for organ uh, harvesting. Uh, according to this report, some of the detainees are forced to wear color-coded bracelets after the health check, and they vanish, they disappear from the camps in the middle of the night. These, these facts and details paint a horrific picture, but don't take our word for it. On the screen behind me and on the poster in front of me is a published interim judgment of the China Tribunal. Uh, I'd also like to enter this into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Sh oh, uh, in December of 18, the China Tribunal pronounced its final judgment on organ harvesting in China, concluding that the Tribunal's members are certain, unanimously, and sure beyond a reasonable doubt that in China, forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience has been practiced for a substantial period of time involving a very substantial number of victims. That's... That's simply horrifying to a surgeon, I can't, must tell you. Uh, Ms. Sadak, you, uh, you spoke of a, one of your students who disappeared, and, uh, and I invite you to enlarge on uh, this story of any other things you know about these people from camps disappearing. And by the way, the rest of the panel, if you have insights, I invite you to lean in as well. Ben şu cezalı agır turvatkan vaklarımda aşağıdaki ki min aprep ekildiğan saç şoprlan anlagandım. Ürümci miçivenge caylaşkan, naiti kent kölemdeki zer taşlat kuzuş orne işki organ soğudu ornak arnip arnip getken ki. Um, as I worked at the concentration camps, I overheard that the policeman the, the, who drives the car and transports people and that the policemen were talking to each other. They said that there was one drug rehabilitation center in Michuan, Urumqi, but later that place turned into organ transplant center. Well, these are horrible things to contemplate. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Mr. Chair shouldn't be lost on us that we are having this hearing on the close of a three-day visit that President Xi has taken to Moscow, standing with Mr. Putin, uh, proclaiming their distrust of the United States while Mr. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine takes place, while more crimes against humanity are being inflicted. And it was a convening arranged under the guise of brokering peace in a conflict whose pretense is universally known to be fabricated. The gross deception that comes from a leader whose actions in Xinjiang, our own State Depart Department across multiple administrations has determined to constitute crimes against humanity and genocide. Mr. Turkle, do you have any reflections on why President Xi would be in Moscow working to align himself with Mr. Putin at this time, in this moment, even as we're having this conversation here this evening? So from, from just observing the, um, the meeting and news reports, he wants to tell the Chinese people that he is still welcomed as a key international player by showing up there previously to Central Asia, as you may recall that he received highest state honor in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan, despite the fact that the Kazakhs and Uyghurs, uh, so is Uzbeks, essentially 
from the same family. So they, that he wants to show to the, uh, the domestic audience that he is still a player in the national community. As you know, the Chinese government has been somewhat isolated in the last few years. And then two, um, he wants to um, uh, serve, uh, to, to find a way to improve China's economic condition. They are not doing well. Um, so, so those are the two observations. And also, before the, uh, Putin's re-invasion of Euro uh, Ukraine, as you may recall, last February, they signed an almost unconditional love uh, letter. So that needs to be displayed. So I, that's my, my take on the visit. Yeah, and it's it's certainly exceptional and profound to have Ms. Hadawachi and Ms. Siddick testifying before us here in Women's History Month on the atrocities that are taking place in these labor camps. And as we saw on the eve of the Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine, we we were able to decouple to an extreme extent. From, from Russia, we were, we were able to break off ties. And, and something our committee is wrestling with is this economic consideration. And we are well aware, based on tonight's hearing, more so aware of the Forced Labor Prevention Act, um, cr creating the presumption that goods produced or manufactured in Xinjiang or by entities with certain ties to Xinjiang are that are made with forced labor unless you know, determined otherwise. And we we need to figure out, and I'm wondering, Mr. Turkle, if you could help us to identify the potential vulnerabilities in the existing law that allow the CCP to get their exports around this Uyghur Forced Labor Protect Protection Act. One of the things uh, in that, uh, that has not been helpful is the $800 de minimis. Uh, that need to uh, they need to be addressed because of that you know some of the consumer products are still available uh, just to research uh, search. a lot of things cost less than eight hundred dollars yeah DGI uh, and on Amazon you will get at least three dozen hits uh, that is a sanctioned company because the the drone is apparently less than eight hundred dollars so so we have to close as simple loopholes as that. And also, I, I genuinely want the business community to, uh, to do some soul checking here. You know, we need to uh, tell them, not on my name. We are complicit in this because of, and this is, this is the same business community just repeating, making us feel that we're seeing IBM 2.0. Yeah. Well, to our survivors, you may not speak our language, but we have heard you tonight, and we will take away on this committee hearing that we will no longer accept the unacceptable. We will no longer allow economics above all else and we will fight for truth, for justice, and for human rights. Thank you and I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Banks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One thing that we haven't talked a whole lot about tonight is the why. Why, why does the CCP round up and persecute the Uyghurs? Mr. Turkle, is it merely or entirely because of their religion, their Muslim faith? Um, to the Chinese government, stability is a paramount concern. Starting 2012, 2013, uh, all the way to 2014, they identify uh, liberalism, uh, Islamism, or Western religion, foreign religion, Western influence, uh, presenting, opposing an existential threat to the CCP leadership. So in order to do that, in order to tackle that problem, they come up with this preemptive policing. So the, the, the way that they're describing the religion in particular, like likening it to thought virus, infectious disease, is very telling. So to the CCP government, the Uyghur people's ethno-religious identity is a virus that will in effect, impact, uh, that will become a bigger problem if the Uyghurs remain to be a distinct ethno-religious group. Same thing is happening, similar thing is happening to the Tibetan people, but the most vulnerable community under that the Western influence pushback effort is the Christians and Muslims. So that shows to the Chinese dis a sign of disloyalty and potential political threat. As you know, earlier today, the CEO of TikTok appeared before a congressional committee. After the committee, his CEO, one of his top 
executives said that the criticism of TikTok coming from members of Congress on both sides of the aisle was rooted in xenophobia. One congressman, uh, Jamal uh, Bowman, even went as far to agree and said it's racist to suggest that we would ban TikTok or to attack TikTok. Um, I wonder, uh, Mr. Turkle, is it a strategy of the Chinese Communist Party to deflect criticism by calling that criticism racist or to talk about Asian American hate or to use that type of, of rhetoric and innuendo uh, to deflect criticism overall? Certainly, they're also taking advantage of American ignorance. They're just presenting something available on App Store that you can download and watch short videos, but they're missing the point. It's intoxicating American uh, minds of the American youth through the fake news, through uh, disinformation. Just case in point. Uh, Genocide denial. The guy that I alluded earlier could not even acknowledge that this, this government he's affiliated with through his job is committing genocide. So American people need to know this company is one of the biggest uh, facilitators, enablers of the ongoing genocide. Yeah, and it's not helpful to use that type of rhetoric, right? I mean, it diminishes the whole point of speaking out against genocide and doing something about it. You would agree with that? Yeah. Would you say that the Biden administration has downplayed Uyghur genocide? Um, to Biden administration's credit, starting from 2020, uh, there are a number of uh, significant decisions were made. For example, acknowledging the previous administration's genocide determination was a huge relief for a lot of us. And also something significantly done was the uh, coordinated sanctions in March 2021 with Canada, UK, and the European Union. That should be the new norm. I would like to see that, and I also would like to see the Biden administration continue to raise this as it did in 2021 at the G, uh, G7. But what is not acceptable today is that some officials in the Biden administration trying to tone down uh, human rights uh, criticism on China's uh, ongoing genocide to get a Chinese uh, cooperation with climate crisis. But we're not seeing, the, seeing this issue on the same page. Climate crisis is not a top priority for the Chinese government. They will do what is best for them, what serves their interests, the leadership and Communist Party, not because of our urging. Can you uh, speak to any specific incidents of, uh, or examples of the State Department backing off, confronting China? State Department has heard? not do that yet, but I'm just uh, troubled by some of the comments uh, made by a special envoy, John Kerry. Uh, the comments made by Energy Secretary recently uh, uh, complimenting uh, China's investment in the green, green technology. They still they subsidize, they use dirty coal, and they enslave human beings. What kind of green technology investment that we're talking about? Here? Dr. Zenz, very quickly, I have just a couple of seconds left. Can you talk about how the CCP intimidates Uyghurs inside of the United States? It does so um, through uh, automated phone calls, at least in some countries. I don't know if the automated phone calls are also a thing in the U.S., uh, but the embassy, the threat of uh, not extending passports, and um, the CCP has an extensive, extensive strategy of um, surveying and intimidating dissidents of all kinds, and um, that's a big problem. Thank you. My time has expired. Time has expired. Mr. Ockenclaus. Thank you, Chairman. As one of Two dozen Jewish representatives in the House, I know too well the consequences of failures to confront hate and mass atrocities. In 1919, nearly 100,000 Jews were murdered in pogroms in Ukraine and Poland. My great-grandparents, like so many families today, escaped the pogroms in Ukraine to save their lives. In the years following the further mass murder of the Holocaust, Radio Free Europe was conceived by the United States to utilize the talents of post-World War II Soviet and Eastern European emigres in support of American foreign policy and international democracy and human rights. In our first hearing, I spoke with Mr. Pottinger about the importance of supporting independent journalism. Radio Free Asia, also developed and funded through the United States Agency for Global Media, is providing these services of independent journalism in the Indo-Pacific region. They were the first media outlet to publish reporting about the CCP's internment, forced separation, slave labor, and sterilization of the Uyghur people. Ms. Kiekeler, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum has a list of, quote, tools for atrocity prevention, 
which include naming and shaming and fact-finding. Can you explain the role of the free press in preventing and exposing human rights abuses in China? Thank you so, Thank you so much for, for the question and also for sharing your own personal experience. The role of Radio Free Asia has been incredibly important and the role of the independent press is essential to telling the story of the, story of the Uyghur people. I wanna highlight a few things. One is that many of the journalists themselves are Uyghur and they're telling the stories of their own communities. I can't even imagine the weight that sits on their shoulders as they do that at great risk to their own personal families and also to broader communities. Two, often they're able to do so in the language of the, the Uyghur language, which the Chinese government is intent on also trying to erase and eliminate. We have to underscore that the Chinese government has destroyed uh, one third of all mosques. They're in the process of really trying to do everything they can to culturally destroy the Uyghur community. So this press is an important way to not just get the story out, but also preserve a historical record and also continuity of the community. But as you mentioned, not just um, Uyghur journalists, but also independent journalists have been able to go and document the stories of what has happened, telling the stories of individuals and survivors that have been able to actually get out. The Chinese government wants you to think that there is no evidence. There is ample evidence of the crimes that are occurring. Yes, we need unfettered access to Xinjiang, but enough information exists. Thank you. Mr. Zenz, Dr. Zenz, excuse me. Uh, the Victims of Communism website hosts a searchable database of imprisoned Uyghurs from leaked documents which were authenticated by 14 world leading outlets. How can the United States government can support uh, the continuation of, of that valuable resource? I think the United States can make use of it, point out its existence. Um, maybe enable translation in different languages and, and a greater leveraging of tools like this. Um, civil society organizations like ourselves and nonprofits, you know, like be it the Holocaust Museum, Victims of Communism, uh, we have been at the forefront of uncovering aspects of the atrocity and documenting it. And um, the government has heavily relied on our work, which we are proud of, but sometimes we wonder uh, why the government isn't doing more of this itself. And it, for example, in 2019, I you know, spoke to the State Department and others, and in 2019, it was, it was made clear to me that the United States government was crucially, cr crucially relying on my open source work and for understanding the atrocity. And I found it very difficult to believe that uh, a single individual uh, was doing work that in the potentially most powerful or sophisticated government in the world um, could not. I understand that the capacity has been increased, but still, I think there's a lot of potential. On the subject of governments doing more, Mr. Turkle, you had mentioned the Human Rights Council vote, 19 to 17 in the yeah. fall, to prevent even discussion, much less action, on the report on the abuse of the Uyghur people. I'll note that Brazil, India, and Mexico all abstained under pressure from the CCP. Uh, <clears throat> what can U.S. diplomats do to convince these rising powers of the global south that uh, their voice is necessary in standing up to the CCP? Just quickly, we need to have a special envoy. This is a full-time job. I think there's a strong coordination required within our government, uh, interagency, intergovernmental efforts. This has to be an office-level, special envoy level of task so that people will take us seriously. Thank you. Thank you. you Thank time expire. Mr. Johnson. First, Ms. Hadawaji, Ms. Sidek, thank you. You have reinforced for us that the Chinese Communist Party is engaged in systemic acts of pure and unadulterated evil. Thank you. Secondly, Mr. Chairman, I would ask for unanimous consent to show a short video from The Economist which displays the terrifyingly Orwellian surveillance state that the CCP has assembled to control the Uyghur people. Without objection, the clerk will play the video. Already the authorities are using facial recognition to name and shame citizens. Even for minor offenses like jaywalking. In Beijing, they're using the technology to prevent people stealing rolls of loo paper from public toilets. And across China, 
Police officers are now trialing sunglasses and body cameras loaded with facial and gesture recognition technology. It's helping them to identify wanted suspects in real time. What worries some people here is that as the technology develops, so too does the capacity for it to be abused. Some of those most at risk in this hyper-surveillance future are the ethnic minorities in China. The authorities are using facial recognition cameras to scan people's faces before they enter markets. The system alerts authorities if targeted individuals stray 300 meters beyond their home. In the future, the government plans to aggregate even more data and build a predictive policing program that imposes even tighter controls here. Without checks and balances, China will keep finding new ways to violate the human rights of its citizens. What's already happening in Xinjiang is a warning the rest of the world must heed. Ms. Kekler, is that an accurate representation? I mean, I would argue that uh, for the plight of the Uyghur community, the situation is even more dire. Uh, you can't walk more than 500 meters without having your face scanned. Uh, I think as our two speakers before mentioned, for all too many Uyghur families, they have a member of the Han community living within their homes. They're being surveilled both through human surveillance and also through high-tech surveillance. So yes, it's an Orwellian system. It's one, as Nori said, where you can simply not escape uh, being followed at any moment. And where right now, as we celebrate Ramadan, merely observing the holiday would be grounds for a person to be detained. Every single Uyghur in this room has family members detained. So that video is really just the tip of the iceberg. Yes. Dr. Zenz, is it accurate to say that American investors and firms are providing Chinese technology firms the resources that they need to develop these high-tech surveillance and control tools? Yes, they have done so, and in some ways still do. And in some ways it's already too late because the Chinese are now on the cutting edge for doing so. So, Mr. Turkel, is it accurate to say that these surveillance tools, as uh, the Chinese Communist Party perfects them, by using them to repress the Uyghur people, could be used to surveil Americans. Absolutely. That's one of the effective tools that they will use uh, to make us, to compromise our personal information, privacy, and also uh, threaten our sovereignty. You know, they will also affect the democratic norms. So we're already seeing the signs in Zimbabwe uh, and in countries that they're using Huawei provided technology to monitor opposition leaders. That would be the new norm that China is trying to create. Chair Turkel, earlier you talked about uh, Uyghur people being forced to put apps that spy on their devices. Yeah. Uh, I would uh, let everyone know, they, some of you probably already know, that TikTok has changed its U.S. privacy policy, allowing the app, the app to automatically collect new types of biometric data, including what it describes as face prints and voice prints. Chair Turkel, is it possible that these kind of high-tech surveillance tools are already on American phones? Yes, that's a, that's, a, that's a spying tool for the Chinese state. They can collect data uh, all around, personal videos, pictures, communications. People argue that our social media companies do that as well, but that's for commercial purpose. But what the Chinese are doing it for national security or whatever human the data that they have is, is a valuable data for advancing their AI technology. I think Ms. Kekler did the right thing by, by reminding us that surveillance on a phone is nothing like the kind of heart-wrenching atrocities that are committed to uh, millions of Uyghur people every day. But I would remind Americans that this is not just a problem over there, it is a problem here. Americans need to get TikTok off their phones. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Torres. China spends more on domestic security than it spends on its own military. At the beginning of Xi Jinping's rule from 2012 to 2017, China's domestic security budget doubled. But in the Xinjiang province, the security budget tripled. Xinjiang has emerged as the most Orwellian police state on earth, with cameras and checkpoints tracking every person, 
and monitoring every behavior that trigger, triggers even the slightest semblance of suspicion. The mass surveillance of Uyghurs reflects the pathological paranoia of a regime that lives in existential fear of its own people, that fears the loss of its own power, and that seeks survival and self-preservation by any means necessary, including genocide. At the heart of genocide is the intent to destroy a people. There is clear and convincing evidence that the CCP has the intent to destroy the culture of Uyghurs, to destroy the identity, the history, and the very fertility of Uyghurs as a people. As a result of forced sterilizations, abortions, and IUD insertions from 2017 to 2019, the birth rates in Xinjiang collapsed by 50 percent, the steepest decline in birth rates in recent history. Not even the genocide in Rwanda or Cambodia or Bosnia produced a comparable collapse in fertility. There are those who do dispute or are hesitant to use the word genocide, but Ms. Kukuler, is it fair to say that the unprecedented collapse in birth rates among Uyghurs, combined with the cultural erasure of Uyghurs through systematic re-education, constitutes compelling evidence of genocide? I think the situation uh, that you just presented is one that is so incredibly alarming that every single person has to take notice and we need to uphold our obligation to prevent genocide. The sad reality is that we're looking at a situation where crimes are already occurring and we should have been responding much earlier to the warning signs and the risk factors of that. And I think it's really important to underscore and there's been much discussion about the why. Perpetrators have many motivations for why they commit crimes and why they escalate their crimes, including up to genocide. And we need to understand their motivations so that we can develop policies that actually are more strategic and targeted to try to change that behavior. The desire for stability is motivated, yes, by concern about identity, uh, perceptions of religious extremism, terrorism, splitism, the three evils that the Chinese government advances. But the reality is there's also an economic motivation. The Belt and Road Initiative, which is critical to Xinjiang, has got three major intersections that cross through that territory. So the commission of these crimes has many different uh, causes, which we have to put more of an emphasis on. Well, there is no Belt and Road without Xinjiang. Exactly. Right. And it also has an abundance of minerals, the highest energy reserves. It has immense strategic importance to the CCP. You know, as we reflect on the genocide against Uyghurs, I'm reminded of the following quote from Justice Robert Jackson in his opening statement at the Nuremberg trials. The wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. And yet, despite this warning, I worry that the international community has lost its sense of shock and horror at the very mention of genocide. And if you are going to invoke the term genocide, as the United States has done, the word genocide, which commands moral weight, must carry with it an obligation to galvanize the world into action. And if you're wondering whether the United States has done enough diplomatically to stop the Uyghur genocide, Look no further than the United Nations Human Rights Council, which voted against even debating, let alone denouncing, the human rights violations in Xinjiang. Even Ukraine voted to abstain. Every Muslim country except Somalia voted no. And so, Mr. Turkel, do you believe, as I do, that the United States, as the leader of the free world, must commit ourselves to building a multilateral coalition aimed at stopping the Uyghur genocide. Absolutely. You know, to your earlier point, uh, words matter. Uh, there is a reason to call this genocide. Once we call it, the next step under, under the Article 1 of the Genocide Conventions is to stop it. And then hold those perpetrators to account. To account. More than 150 countries around the world are state party to the Genocide Convention. Only 10, including some parliaments, our government, give a proper name to this crime. It's a genocide. It's crime against humanity. It is past time for action. Again, as I said, this has been ongoing genocide in the last six, seven years. And my time's about to expire, but as we reflect on Ramadan, there is no government on earth that has done more to demonize the Muslim faithful and to desecrate the Muslim faith than the Chinese Communist Party. Absolutely. And with that, I'll leave it at that. Ms. Hinton. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and um, such powerful stories we've heard here tonight, and I have no doubt that this will be uh, the first of many conversations that we have 
um, not just as a committee, but as a Congress, about how tainted our supply chain has become uh, because of the CCP's truly abhorrent use of Uyghur slave labor and acts of genocide against the Uyghur people. It's frankly disgusting and heartbreaking, um, and we have to do more. So I'll be focusing tonight on sharing the truth about these horrifying links to the CCP's atrocities around the world. We know the Uyghur people have been silenced time and time again in, in China, but they will not be silenced here tonight. So thank you for sharing your stories. Um, and before we get to our witnesses tonight, uh, my questions, I'd like to share some truly disturbing and eye-opening videos from Radio Free Asia journalists. Um, they are sharing their stories of how the CCP directly targeted them by framing them as terrorists keeping detailed and often falsified information about them and their families, and in many horrifying cases, detaining their families as well. So I'd like to, Mr. Chairman, if we can play that video. The clerk will play the video. My name is Gilchek Rahoja. I'm a journalist at Radio Free Asia. As a journalist for simply doing my job, the Chinese government has sent at least 24 members of my family to the concentration camps and accuse me of being a terrorist and put me on their wanted list. Just because we have worked to expose the abuse that by CCP, me and my colleagues at Radio Free Asia becoming a target of an authoritarian regime. My name is Mehmet Janjuma. Because of our work at RFA, our families in China have been persecuted and imprisoned. Recently leaked Chinese police documents show that at least 29 of my immediate and extended family have been profiled or detained. I learned that all three of my brothers were taken to the camps at some point, and one of them has been sentenced to 14 years in jail for merely receiving my phone calls. My relatives are demonized, targeted, and persecuted purely because of their connection to me. The guilt that I feel haunts me every day. But I know, maybe because of this heavy price, that my work as journalist... His work does matter. And uh, what a haunting thing to say that that guilt haunts him every single day because of what's happening to his family. Um, as a former reporter, seeing and hearing about the CCP's silencing of independent journalists and their families is like truly watching a dystopian horror story play out, but it's not a story, it's real. So Ms. Kikoler, can you please provide some historical context for us tonight, comparing how Xi Jinping is containing Uyghurs using facial recognition software, surveillance tech, uh, technology as well, to how the Nazis used uh, containment during the Holocaust? Thank you so much um, for your question and also just for sharing the stories of uh, many of our, our colleagues. You know, I think that it's really important as an institution, what we try to do is we try to draw the lessons from the past and apply them to the future so that we can hopefully prevent these crimes from occurring. Tragically, what we're doing right now is we're talking about crimes as they are actually ongoing. Um, I think when we think in the Holocaust context, yes, technology was used. It was used as a means of uh, counting, uh, Jewish populations, creating sensor, uh, censuses to identify the populations, for containing people. Uh, but it's very hard to draw comparisons because each situation is so different and so unique. And I think we really need to focus on what is happening right now in China and what are the specifics of the crimes that are being perpetrated by the Chinese government at this particular point. Mm -hmm. What we do know is the commonality in the experiences of the suffering. We know what it feels like, and so many of the Holocaust survivors that have spoken to our Uyghur partners and have participated in events talk about the pain of what it feels to be separated from their loved ones. Though we span 80 years, that is the tie that binds because that is something that people understand just so intimately on such a human, human level. Yeah. And absolutely, we heard tonight um, our witnesses describe them being called by numbers, right? And you talk about the similarities there. Um, between those situations. Um, with the few moments we have left, Dr. Zenz, can you re react to the videos that I shared here tonight and just provide your perspective um, as someone who's an expert on victimization under communism, which is exactly what we saw? So one of the strategies and probably a reason for the scale of the mass internments is the guilt by association. And we, you know, we've had the testimony of you know, uh, detaining family members, uh, punishing 
uh, individuals by detaining uh, uh, others. And we have horrific incidents for uh, the parents of Uyghur dissidents or Uyghurs in exile were paraded on Chinese state television denouncing their children for advocacy on behalf of the Uyghurs. And um, I think that's one of the reasons why we have this incredible scale also for the detention by guilt by association. Thank you, Dr. Zenz. I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first, I want to start from a place of gratitude by thanking the witnesses, particularly um, Director Kikoler and the uh, Uyghur survivors, as well as Elisha Wiesel, uh, the survivor of the Holocaust, who gave us a video testimony at the top of this hearing. In Ohio's 11th Congressional District, we are proud to have members of the community that has also dealt with the trauma and legacy of genocide. And yes, I am also referring to the Holocaust. Um, Jewish survivors in Cleveland erected a memorial to the Holocaust, our very own Cole Israel Memorial in 1961, which is the oldest of its kind in the country. Survivors anticipated that scapegoating and hateful sentiments toward marginalized groups could repeat itself and hoped that the memorial would be a beacon of remembrance, education, and a reminder of never again. Tragically, the world has found itself facing actions of danger and intolerance once more. In this committee, we have the opportunity to develop policies that increase our competitiveness through investments in technologies of the future, workforce development and skills-based education, and improving our high-skilled immigration system. As we pursue this committee's work, we must work against xenophobia, anti-Asian stereotyping, and any efforts to raise suspicions against Chinese Americans who do not bear the responsibility of the actions of the Chinese Communist Party. As our witnesses have demonstrated, the Uyghur genocide and the ramifications of past genocidal movements are relevant today. The lessons we must learn from questions about the Americans' action to address the Holocaust are extremely relevant to our present discussion. According to the Anti-Defamation League, over three quarters of Americans, 85%, believe at least one anti-Jewish trope, as opposed to 61% found in 2019. 20% of Americans believe six or more tropes it's the highest measured levels in decade. So, Ms. Kikolar, I know you expressed that we have to move forward, but I think it's important that we touch on something from the past so that we can avoid the same mistakes. Can you describe the movements or bigotry that led to the genocide of approximately six million European Jews and at least five million Soviet prisoners of war, disabled individuals, Romani, Jehovah's Witnesses, gay individuals, and others during the Holocaust? Thank you so much, Representative Brown, for, for your question. Um, I think what I'd like to do, perhaps in, in answering, is just bridge uh, what lies often at the root of the commission of so many of these crimes, and that is unchecked hate. And I think when we talk about Islamophobia, when we talk about anti-Semitism, when we talk about anti-Chinese sentiment, uh, at the root of that is the perception of difference and the inability to come together as a people to understand that we are bound by the same common uh, threads that, um, that unite us all. There's no difference between Nuri and I. We suffer the same way. Our families and experiences are the same. But I think, unfortunately, what happens all too long is that there is the intentional desire to create divisions amongst people. And when we look at the situation in China, the Chinese government has also been working very hard to create the conditions in which genocidal ideology can take root. The same thing happened in Nazi Germany. What's illustrative in the context of Germany was there was an effort by the Nazi government to do a boycott of Jewish-owned businesses early into their reign, it did not work because neighbors would not turn on neighbors. But yet years later, when they did it again, it was effective. In the context of what is happening in China right now, the longer and longer that these crimes occur, the longer that Chinese government officials are able to utter simply hateful rhetoric to demonize the entire Uyghur community as being terrorists, we are unfortunately entrenching this type of Han supremacy and a genocidal ideology that will be all the harder to uh, undermine and to dismantle. 
So I think when we think about the lessons of the Holocaust and we think about just the generational trauma that that has occurred, we have to be committed here as a group of people who are vested in advancing the best interests of people kind, but also of American values and doing everything we can to stop the crimes happening right now. I think the most important thing that we talk about as an institution is that everything we do matters. Each of us has the ability to affect positive change. And for the American public that are watching right now, as Nuri said, this is a genocide that in some ways is proximate. Each of us likely owns a t-shirt that might have come from slave labor in Xinjiang. We may not know it, but we have a responsibility to understand that our actions may be harming people who are living under conditions that are simply incomprehensible, yet they're real. Well, I wanna thank you for that. And um, again, reiterate my appreciation for everyone's presence here today. And I look forward to continuing productive conversations around strategic competition and maintenance of ethno-religious freedoms here and abroad. And with that, I yield back. Mr. Menes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, um, and I, wanna, I wanna thank um, Ms. Um, Idawaji and Siddiq for, for their very powerful, um, very powerful testimony. And you know, I guess I'm gonna wrap this, this up. I'm the last one, last one up, but um, I wanna make sure that people understand that, that when, when I speak about the, the Chinese Communist Party or the, the, the government of, of, of China, I never, I'm, I don't have anything against the, the, the Chinese people as a whole. I just hate communism. Yeah. I hate communism because uh, you know, I, I come from Cuba uh, and I had to leave because uh, of a communist state, which a lot of the things that I'm hearing uh, are happening in China happen in Cuba. Not the same, because uh, I, don't, I haven't heard of, of genocide happening in Cuba, because they're all Cubans, right? So, can you name me the, the companies, American companies, that are benefiting from the forced labor and the atrocities committed on, committed on the Uyghur people in China. Can you name it? Because somebody said we need, to, we need to name names here. And so what, company, what American companies are actually profiting from the, uh, the suffering of the Uyghur people? The companies that have been in the news uh, include Nike, uh, Coca-Cola, Intel, uh, and some of the solar panel uh, manufacturers, and also, um, some European companies uh, like Siemens, uh, Volkswagen, as I noted earlier. So there we talk about more than 80 global brands. Uh, it, it, it's a large number. This is precisely, uh, it, this is part of the reason that with the USFL, F, UFLPA, we're not, we have not been able to stop the uh, forced labor practices in China. How are they able to skirt any laws that, uh, that prohibit the use of forced labor et cetera, and still operate and sell their products in the United States? A uh, couple of years, I, I think it was last year, or well, late 2021, CECC held a hearing. Um, they had uh, business representatives, American um, multinational corporation representatives, and none of them even willing to acknowledge that there's human rights abuses against the Uyghur people. This was on the record that anyone can go and watch on the CECC YouTube channel. But is it proven that, uh, that is it proven, well, I guess they, they won't acknowledge it, great, okay. But we know it's happening, right? right. The other thing that, that really bothers me about you know, today's um, um, hearing was the, uh, the issue of the organ um, harvesting. Um, do you, are, are any of you aware of this? Or any of you deny it? Does anybody think it's not true? Or of, the, of all the witnesses here, does anybody have any, any knowledge of that actually happening? Uh, my colleague at Victims of Communism, uh, Matthew Robertson, has published um, a paper in America's leading transplant journal examining over 100,000 Chinese academic research papers and closely looking at 2,800 of them. And in 71 Chinese research papers, he found in the text uh, evidence that basically the uh, donor rule was not observed, meaning that um, several of the persons in question were executed through organ extraction. 
So, you know, what I read in the testimony, or at least what I read, was that they, they, there's a calculation of some 25 to 50,000 28-year-olds, because apparently that's, that's the age, the great age. The best age to get your organs harvested is when you're 28 years old. Uh, the murder of 25, the outright murder of 25 to 50,000 28-year-olds by the Chinese Communist Party for organ harvesting. Do, as, does anybody doubt that number? I, I certainly don't. I'll tell you why, because uh, there's also evidence that you can, you can schedule your organ transplant, basically an organ on demand. Now, I find, I find that, I, don't, I find the, the Chinese Communist Party not only to be repressive and, and uh, brutal, it's also barbaric. And, and if we don't do something about it, and if we don't stop this, then my fear is that my children and my grandchildren will one day face a world where they're going to be dominated by this, uh, by this party. And so you may be the bellwether of what could happen to, to this country, to this world, if we don't take action today. Because the only thing that the Chinese Communist Party uh, reacts to is action, not rhetoric, action. My time is up. I yield back. Thank you. I want to thank all of our witnesses for their incredible testimony and the phenomenal Q&A that we just had. I want to thank our committee members for their thoughtful contributions. Uh, tonight we've had, we've been witness to soul-chilling evidence of crimes against humanity. Uh, we've heard from experts who showed that the policy of forced sterilization, forced IUD insertion, and forced abortion easily clears any commonly used definition of genocide. We've heard that detainment of Uyghurs is the largest internment of an ethno-religious minority since the Holocaust. We've heard that the entire region has been turned into an open-air prison through the most oppressive techno-totalitarian surveillance system ever devised. We've heard that American companies are complicit in the forced labor being extracted from the Uyghur population. We have heard that American investors, banks, and pension funds are financing companies engaged in surveillance, forced labor, and the building of internment camps. Most importantly, we heard from Gulbahar Haitawaji and Kelbiner Saduk, women who were firsthand witnesses in the camps. What else do we possibly need to hear? In Elie Wiesel's Nobel Peace Prize speech, he imagined the boy he'd been in the concentration camps talking to the man he had become. And he said, and now the boy is turning to me. Tell me, he asks. What have you done with my future? What have you done with your life? And I tell him that I've tried, that I've tried to keep memory alive, that I've tried to fight those who would forget. Because if we forget, we are guilty. We are accomplices. And then I explained to him how naive we were, that the world did know and remained silent. My friends, uh, as Ms. Kikolar astutely pointed out in her written testimony, um, many often wonder what they would have done if they'd been alive during the Holocaust. Today, you said, we want people to ask, now that I know, what will I do? This is our never again moment. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Members, I remind you that your questions for the record are due one week from today on March 30th. Your staff will receive instructions shortly. And with that, without objection, the committee hearing is adjourned.